What's up guys, it's your boy Omni Sensei. Welcome to What If Zoro Was Reborn in JJK as Toji Sun, Part 3. Like, share, and comment on the video. Hit the subscribe button if you haven't subscribed already. Also, remember to check out the original story, link in the description. Consider joining my Patreon to support the channel. With all that out of the way, let's get into it. There's no problem. There are no broken teeth, and two teeth are slightly wobbly, but that's just because the baby teeth are falling out and the permanent teeth are coming in. It's too early to pull them out now, so you can either let them fall out on their own at home or come back in a few months. Toji listened to the dentist's explanation, glancing at Zoro, who was sitting on the dental chair with a sullen expression inside the examination room. Zoro's sharp gaze met Toji's, but Toji didn't mind. After all, who insisted on doing something his father warned was dangerous? Zaro-kun is now 5 years old, and it's a bit early for him to be losing baby teeth. Normally, the lower front teeth fall out between ages 6 and 7, and the upper front teeth between ages 7 and 8, but for Zaro-kun, both are already making way for permanent teeth. It meant that Zoro was growing 2 to 3 years faster than other children. It seemed even faster than that by 1 to 2 years when he was younger. Even now, he was still young. But his teeth are wobbling, and he put a sword in his mouth? Such an incorrigible son. Toji shook his head. The dentist asked, genuinely curious, but what exactly did Zoro-kun put in his mouth? I heard it was something hard and metallic unable to admit it was a sword, Toji vaguely dodged the question. Leaving the dentist with Zoro, who still had a grumpy expression, Toji tapped Zoro on the back. Why did you put the sword in your mouth? That's my sword technique. Three sword style. Do it a few years later. After all your teeth have come in. Zoro made an intrigued expression, huh, you're not saying to stop it or not do it anymore. Changed your mind? I've seen it myself. Zoro with two swords and Zoro with three swords were different. Having experienced it firsthand, Toji wasn't foolish enough to object. Toji startled and looked into the distance. Far away, at the edge of his vision, he saw, or felt, a small figure sitting on a rooftop. The figure leaped down from the building and attached itself to a passerby. Then, suddenly, the voice of the annoyed passerby complaining of a headache, calmed down. At Zoro's words, Toji regained some of his composure. Zoro explained. When you've just awakened observation hockey, like father, you might strongly sense presences or unintentionally activate observation hockey. So, learning to control it was necessary. Toji managed to finally retract his observation hockey and took a breath of relief. So this is hockey. Yeah. You've got both observation and armament hockey now. How does it feel? I'm not sure. It didn't seem as impressive as he had thought, especially the armament hockey. Toji still found using his physical abilities or curse tools more convenient and effective. When the Waito Ichimanji clashed with Playful Cloud, Playful Cloud was pushed back. Whether that was because of Zoro's superior hockey or the sword's performance was better, he wasn't sure. It could be both. Plus, when my armament hockey clashed with Zoro's, mine was clearly overwhelmed. It meant Toji's hockey was significantly inferior to Zoro's. Hearing this, Zoro snorted. Your armament hockey is still at a basic level. Normally, when armament hockey clashes, the stronger one wins. Of course, this assumes other conditions like physical abilities, weapon skills, condition, and combat experience are equal. In actual combat, the outcome can vary. How do you increase the power of hockey? By fighting strong opponents, risking your life. Whether your opponent dies or you do. Hockey develops in extreme combat situations where the life or death of you and your opponent hangs on a single attack. Hearing Zoro's words, Toji seriously pondered. He couldn't easily think of an opponent worth risking his life against. Being an assassin, Toji's usual combat style was to wait for the opponent to be at their weakest before launching a surprise attack, rather than engaging in a head-on battle. The only ones who might pose a threat to my life are that brat from the Goho family, and that woman who recently became a special grade. Since that woman went overseas as soon as she became a special grade, Satoru Goho might be a potential opponent for him. Seeing Toji deep in thought, Zoro smiled as if amused. Seems like you have a few people in mind? Yeah. Who? Satoru Goho. Satoru Goho? Zoro repeated the name a few times. Satoru Goho. Satoru Goho, huh? Is he strong? Just. So you know, don't even think about fighting that guy. Toji stated firmly and coldly to Zoro. Maybe after you're an adult, but if it's before that, you'll definitely be outmatched. That strong? He was destined to be the strongest from birth. The six eyes. Plus, a sorcerer born with limitless cursed energy. It would be stranger if he didn't stand at the apex. Zaro's lips twisted. The person who was destined to be the strongest. I hate that kind of thing the most. Zaro. I won't fight. 
I don't even know what kind of person he is. He's about 10 years older than you. His hair is white, and his eyes are unique. Eyes? Toji recalled the blue six eyes that had precisely turned to look at him from behind. Eyes that seemed to contain the vast sky, infinitely clear and deep. Eyes that could discern even a curse with zero cursed energy, embodying all mysteries and truths. Truly, eyes that contain the sky. Toji muttered to himself before snapping back to reality. Anyway, don't fight with Satoru Goho if you can avoid it. I don't plan on confronting him head on either. He had no intention of entering a death trap just for the sake of training his hockey. Making an enemy of Satoru Goho would be no different from declaring war on the Goho clan, one of the three great sorcerer families with significant influence in the Jujutsu world. For Toji, who had two children to consider, it was absolutely something to avoid. Besides, there was no reason to fight in the first place. Toji changed the subject and asked another question. By the way, is it common for both observation and armament hockey to manifest at the same time? I'm not sure. There are many people who only have one or the other. What about you? Both manifested at the same time for me, just like you, father. Zaro remembered his fight with Mr. One. At that time, it was a very basic level of observation and armament hockey, being able to discern the position of the sword and cut through steel, even though he didn't know it was hockey. From what I see, father, even among those with observation hockey, you seem to have a particularly strong ability to sense cursed energy. He was better at detecting playful cloud than the Waito Ichimanji, and focusing on the presence of the figure on the rooftop in a city full of so many distractions, almost confirmed it. Does it vary from person to person? Of course. Observation hockey isn't the same for everyone. Some people, like Luffy, are sensitive to others' emotions, while others, like that annoying curly-browed chef who especially senses women, have their observation hockey's range and accuracy increase only in specific situations. In Zoro's case, his observation hockey is specialized in assessing an opponent's strength and in combat situations. My observation hockey is particularly good at sensing cursed energy Toji let out a short laugh. It was ironic that he, who possessed no cursed energy at all, had hockey specialized in detecting it. Being ostracized by his family for lacking cursed energy and later living by killing sorcerers with cursed energy weapons, it might make sense for Toji to be sensitive to cursed energy. Even if he had come to accept and reflect on himself, the time spent couldn't just disappear. You'll need about a year more to master hockey proficiently. A year so, a total of two years training in hockey. Yes. After that, it's up to you. Toji was convinced. To become stronger in hockey, one would need to engage in life-threatening battles, and Zoro couldn't find such opponents for him. Now give back the Waito Ichimanji. No. Why not? Exactly, your teeth are wobbly, why would you wield a sword? Toji remembered the Waito Ichimanji being swallowed whole by the cursed storage vessel. It was a shame, but if given back, he'd just keep biting it. Noticing Toji's thoughts, Zoro, conflicted, asked, If I promise not to put it in my mouth, will you give it back? After thinking for a moment, Toji laid out the conditions. Promise not to put the sword in your mouth until all your permanent teeth have come in, except in life-threatening emergencies, and I'll give it back. What will you do? Okay. Then, let's pinky promise. Watching Zoro reluctantly linking pinkies, Toji couldn't help but laugh. Autumn passed, and winter went by. The new year arrived, and then came spring summer arrived. Megumi, who had grown noticeably, wanted to visit more places. Having read picture books featuring various animals, Megumi yearned to see them in person. So, Zoro and Toji picked a day to take Megumi to the Ueno Zoo, Tokyo's oldest and most visited zoo in Japan. Wearing a yellow, round hat, Megumi excitedly stretched Zoro's cheeks with his hands and shouted, Brother, look! Elephants! Elephants! Toji gently removed Megumi's hands and said, You shouldn't pull on Zoro's face, Megumi. It hurts brother. Hurts? Say sorry to your brother. Sorry. That's right. Toji then hoisted Megumi onto his shoulders. Elevated to a higher vantage point, Megumi could now see the elephants and laugh joyfully. Unfortunately, for Zoro, who had conversed with a talking raccoon and been comrades with reindeer, and seen elephants big enough to walk across the sea, the zoo wasn't particularly exciting. It's even hotter. Despite being June, the weather was quite warm. They were thirsty, but the bottled water they brought from home was already finished. Zoro, fanning himself, looked around and spotted a place selling ice water in the distance. Just as Zoro naturally started heading towards it, Toji, without even looking, quickly grabbed him. Where are you going? To buy some ice water. Toji glanced at the ice water stall for a moment, and then frowned. All the ice water there has already sold out. It looks like it will take some time for the vendor to bring more. You're getting pretty skilled at using it now. Observation hockey. After all that training with you, it would be bad if I couldn't use it. About seven months after awakening his hockey, Toji had become quite proficient at using both observation and armament hockey. 
Now, Toji could turn his observation and armament hockey on and off as he wished, and he was also able to apply armament hockey to his weapons. But that's about it. His armament hockey was significantly weaker compared to Zoro's, and he hadn't yet dared to try predicting the future with observation hockey, or using armament hockey for remote emission or internal destruction. I did teach him six powers, Rakishiki, too, but since Zoro couldn't demonstrate it himself, Toji hadn't managed to do it yet. Toji carefully set Megumi down on the ground and looked around. He was scanning for the presence of any strong beings with his observation hockey. After confirming there was no dangerous presence, Toji instructed Zoro. Stay here with Megumi. I'll go buy some ice water from somewhere else. Papa, go. Where? To buy water. Wouldn't it be better if I went instead? Stay. Here. Toji spoke decisively. At his firm words, Zoro nodded. If anything happens, call me right away. Thinking of the mobile phone Toji had given him not long ago, Zoro nodded. Toji quickly blended into the crowd at the zoo and disappeared. After all, his speed and stealthiness were commendable. Zoro shook his head in disbelief. Elephant, elephant. Megumi was still completely engrossed in watching the elephants. Seeing this, Zoro recalled the animals at the zoo that Megumi seemed to particularly enjoy today. Rabbits, frogs, owls, snakes, deer, and bison. Come to think of it, he always wants to pet dogs whenever we see them on walks. Does he just like all animals? Zoro wondered. But then again, he seemed a bit scared of the street cats that pass by our house. It's strange because deer, bison, and elephants are much larger than cats. And certainly, those are much more dangerous than cats. I don't know. Zoro let go of the thought. Holding Megumi's hand in one hand, he fanned himself with the other. Sweat dripped down due to the heat. That's when the incident occurred. A curse's presence. Zoro immediately sent Megumi behind him and placed his hand on the handle of the Wado Ichimanji strapped to his waist. A curse was flying towards them at a terrifying speed. No, it was odd to say it flew by itself. It was as if it had been hit by some attack it feels like it was sent flying. Whoosh, bang. A curse resembling a bird with five heads, crashed into the zoo's enclosure fence and then slid down. People looked around in surprise at the sudden loud noise, but being non-sorcerers, they couldn't discern the cause. Brother, that. It's okay. Zoro comforted Megumi, who was clutching his collar tightly. Unlike Zoro, who could only vaguely make out its shape with observation hockey, Megumi, being a sorcerer, could see the curse's form clearly, which might have scared him more. The curse had been hit by an unknown attack, its head nearly half gone. It seemed the impact of that attack had sent it flying all the way here. So, the one who launched that attack ah, here they come. Sensing the rapidly approaching presences, Zoro moved closer to Megumi. They're strong. And not just one, but two. Excluding Toji, these were the first strong beings Zoro had detected in this world. Zoro pulled out his cell phone, pressed speed dial 1, and called Toji. Toji, too, would have sensed these presences with his observation hockey, and was likely already rushing over. Among the crowd, two men walked up. Why did it have to fly this way? That's why I told you not to forget to put up the barrier. Ha, as if you didn't forget too. You were supposed to do it, Satoru. Satoru. Zoro keenly caught that name. It was definitely the person Toji had mentioned before, someone Toji could potentially risk his life fighting against. Squeezing through the people, two young men who looked to be high school students appeared. One had a peculiar hairstyle with a single black forelock hanging down, and the rest of the hair tied up, while the other wore black sunglasses, and had stark white hair. Both were tall and handsome, dressed in the same dark blue clothes with the same badge. White hair. That matched the description Toji had given of Satoru Goho. So, this one must be Satoru Goho. Zaro focused his attention on the one with white hair. Whiff. The deceased curse vanished completely. The man with white hair exaggeratedly sighed. Arriving just to die. What a waste of the entrance fee. That's why you should have put up the barrier from the start. Now that it's come to this, should we take a look around the zoo, Suguru? I don't want to get scolded by Yaga-sensei. We'd probably get scolded even more for that. Suddenly, the man with white hair turned his gaze to Zoro. The man crouched down in front of Zoro, matching his eye level. When he removed his sunglasses, Zoro could fully understand what Toji had said before. Eyes that contain the sky. Like the lofty sky of immeasurable height, infinitely high and clear. The vastness capable of encompassing all mysteries resided within this man's eyes. And Zoro realized, it wasn't just about what could be seen, he could understand more. The flow of cursed energy is unbelievably detailed. All the cursed energy this man possessed was being delicately controlled through those eyes, without a single grain of waste. Satoru? Despite his friend's puzzled call, the man with white hair, continued to examine Zoro with his astonishingly clear and blue eyes. A sound of admiration, heh, escaped the man's lips. What are you? 
Before Zoro could answer, both he and Satoru Goho turned their heads in the same direction. Whoosh! Toji, who had quickly approached from that direction, positioned himself in front of Zoro, wedging himself between Zoro and Goho, with his weapon storage curse already wrapped around him. Satoru Goho frowned as if he couldn't believe what he was seeing. Then, as if recalling something, he tilted his head. Have we met somewhere before? Without responding, Toji moved his hand towards the mouth of the weapon storage curse, as if to draw a weapon. Zoro caught Toji's hand. There's no injury. He hasn't done anything yet. It meant there was no need for a fight. If this man really was Satoru Goho, as Toji had mentioned, engaging in combat, especially with Megumi here, would be disadvantageous. Moreover, there were too many people around. Sensing the implication, Toji lowered his hand but gripped Zoro's hand tightly. What's going on? I don't know, but where did that guy come from? I didn't see him. Shall we go back? There was a weird loud noise earlier people had already started murmuring, noticing something amiss. The man with the peculiar forelock spoke lowly next to Goho. Satoru, I don't know what's going on, but we can't do this here. You're alarming the people. Because of this tennis ball-headed kid. Look at him. What kind of kid walks around with a katana on his waist? It's not like we're in the Edo period. As Satoru Goho gestured towards Zoro behind Toji, Toji moved even closer to Zoro. Jito, having glanced at the scene, commented, it's rude to compare people to tennis balls, Satoru. But that sword does look odd. Could it be fake? If it were real, they wouldn't have allowed it at the entrance. Well, non-sorcerers wouldn't see it. That belt, it's an item covered with an illusion technique to hide the weapon attached to it. It's cheap so sorcerers can easily see through it. But more suspicious than the belt is that suddenly appearing guy. He has no cursed energy at all. No cursed energy? While they conversed, Toji and Zoro exchanged meaningful glances. Should we make a run for it? Let's do it. Seizing a moment when the crowd's attention was momentarily dispersed, Toji, carrying Zoro and Megumi, ran with all his might. Goho, spotting them, yelled out in shock. Hey, wait. Hey. Hey. Who runs away while the protagonist is talking? Of course, Toji didn't pretend to listen and continued to run at full speed. Watching Toji become a tiny dot in the distance, Satoru expressed his frustration. Damn, can't attack because of the people. Suguru, do something. What can I do in such a crowded place? Plus, he's too fast. They hadn't taken the usual paths where people walk, but had headed towards the wooded area of the mountain, and they were already out of sight. How could someone supposedly without cursed energy move so fast? Unlike Jito, who was simply amazed, Goho was stomping his feet in frustration for letting an intriguing person slip away. Ah, so annoying. Stop right there e. After running for a while, Toji finally stopped halfway up the mountain. Zaro, holding Megumi, hopped down from Toji's back. Zaro clutched his slightly dizzy head. So this is what it's like when dad runs at top speed. He learned something new. Are you okay? Yeah. Didn't I tell you? I'm not hurt. But what worried him was Megumi. Even though Zoro had held him tightly, fearing he might bump into something while running, the speed must have been felt. What if he cried? Worried, Zoro looked down at Megumi in his arms. Megumi was. With his cheeks flushed red, he was gaping in awe. Wow. His eyes sparkled brightly. Like a child who had just ridden an extremely fun amusement park ride, Megumi wore a huge smile, bouncing up and down in Zoro's arms. Again. 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 I'm not sure if I should be happy about this. Watching this scene from beyond Zoro, Toji chuckled and commented. Just like a sorcerer. What do you mean? Unable to outright say his child was crazy, Toji closed his mouth. Well, as long as he's not crying, it's fine. Thinking this, Zoro comfortably adjusted Megumi in his arms as he continued to chant for more. Zoro then asked Toji. Who were those guys just now? Satoru Goho and his peer, probably. They were wearing traditional high school uniforms. Traditional? Jujutsu High, short for Jujutsu High School. It's often called High or Jujutsu High. It's a high school that trains sorcerers, with one in Tokyo and another in Kyoto. When Toji sensed Satoru Goho's presence with his observation hockey, he felt as if his heart had dropped. That immense cursed energy and his noble presence. Even as he ran with all his might towards where Zoro and Megumi were, his mind was racing, worrying if something had happened to them. Logically, there was no reason for Satoru Goho, especially at his young age, to harm two children, one of whom was a non-sorcerer. Has that guy enrolled in Tokyo Jujutsu High? Honestly, Toji hadn't imagined it. Typically, young sorcerers from famous sorcerer families like the Three Great Families, receive training within their own families, and seldom enroll in Jujutsu High. Plus, the Goho family, like the Zenin family, is based in Kyoto. 
Toji had assumed that if Goho were to enroll in a high school, it would be the Kyoto branch, not leaving Kyoto to enroll in the Tokyo branch. For some reason, this was bad news to Toji. Should I move? Toji pondered seriously. If Toji were to say it's dangerous here and suggest moving, Zaro would pack up without any complaints. That's why, conversely, Toji hated to bring it up. He likes this house. There was no denying it when sometimes he'd lie sprawled out on the living room floor, snoring away, or when he'd hold Megumi and look out the window just like Chie used to do. This house was a space filled with memories for Zoro, a place of utmost comfort. He didn't want to take away something Zoro already loved, let alone fail to provide something better. By the way, the ice water? Toji pulled out a bottle of frozen water from his pocket and handed it over. Taking the ice water, Zoro opened the lid and drank it greedily, letting out a satisfied sigh. Unlike the carefree Zoro, Toji's mind was filled with all sorts of thoughts. What should I do? Toji's worries only deepened. In other news, earlier today at Tokyo Zoo Inno Zoo, an incident occurred where the enclosure fence for the elephant suddenly shook with a loud noise. The incident caused a commotion among visitors who were viewing the elephants at the time. The zoo authorities have explained the incident as resulting from the aging fence and a temporary disturbance by the elephants. The zoo has apologized and will be refunding the admission fees to visitors who were near the elephant enclosure at the time of the incident, and they plan to replace the fence as soon as possible, Yaga Masamichi glanced at the TV set in the classroom, before turning his head towards three students. One female student and two male students. The female student, Yeri Shoko, was looking at her nails with an indifferent expression. After all, she hadn't gone on a mission today and had stayed at Jujutsu High, so she had no reason to be scolded. Yaga called out the names of the male students, one with white hair wearing sunglasses and the other with long forelocks hanging down. Satoru Goho, Suguru Jido. Yes, teacher. Suguru Jido sat up straight and responded politely, while Satoru Goho, who had been lounging in his chair with his legs crossed, merely nodded his head. Though his attitude was disrespectful, Yaga, knowing well that getting angry over every little thing would leave him without a stomach, chose to ignore it and continued. Congratulations on successfully completing the Grade 1 Curse Extermination mission today. Thank you. What's this? Yaga-sensei is praising us too. Not yet finished. Yaga thought to himself and continued his speech. But, having completed the mission successfully and on your way back to Jujutsu High, encountering a Grade 2 curse and sending it flying to Ueno Zoo without even setting up a barrier, causing a commotion there, I wonder who could that be? Confess. Suguru Jido wore a troubled expression. Even though it was said that Satoru Goho could be a bit crazy, it wasn't right to snitch on a classmate. Yet, he also didn't want to be mistakenly blamed and punished for something he hadn't done. However, Yaga had already discerned the culprit from Jido's expression. Yaga turned his head towards Goho, who was sitting in a slouchy posture. It's you, Satoru Goho. Ah, really nitpicky. Anyway, most of the people at the zoo couldn't even see the curse ouch. Bang. Yaga Masamichi's fist came crashing down on top of Satoru Goho's head. You're writing the report yourself, Goho. Uselessly strict hands Yaga left the classroom, slamming the door behind him. Goho whined. Shoko, heal me. No way. It's your fault, isn't it? Why don't you reverse the curse technique yourself? If I could do that, why would I ask you? Ah, it hurts. With a large bump on his head, Goho groaned in pain. Ieri Shoko, lighting a cigarette, said, Anyway, if most were non-sorcerers, it means there were sorcerers too. Did a sorcerer happen to visit the zoo? Yeah. Tiny though. Like a fairy? Goho gestured roughly to indicate the height. Ieri exhaled smoke and asked, Heh, a kid? How old? I don't know. Three years old? Satoru Goho thought of the tennis ball-headed boy who had desperately hidden a child behind his back. It was too bad for the tennis ball-headed kid, but despite hiding, it was clearly visible to the naked eye. If hiding behind the back made them invisible, then the Goho family elders wouldn't have made such a fuss about producing a six-eyes user for hundreds of years. Goho smirked crookedly. It was a boy with spiky hair, definitely a sorcerer. The curse technique probably hadn't manifested yet due to his age. Shouldn't we inform Yaga-sensei if he's a sorcerer? Not interested. Goho waved his hand dismissively at Jito's question. The sorcerer had a decent amount of cursed energy, but there were many like him. His curse technique hadn't manifested yet. Besides, it would be at least another 10 years before he could actively participate as a sorcerer. Goho leaned his chin on the desk. What I'm interested in is something else. Who? Ah, uh, that person with no cursed energy? As Jito inquired, Goho trailed off, saying well, he couldn't say he wasn't interested. It was unusual, after all. A non-sorcerer with maximized physical abilities instead of cursed energy, I've never heard or seen such a person. With absolutely no cursed energy, that gorilla-sized physique allowed him to move quickly without being detected. 
If he hadn't deliberately intervened, even I would have found it difficult to locate him. He felt like he had seen him somewhere before, but since he couldn't remember, he let it go. But what I'm most interested in is something else. Though it was the first time seeing a non-sorcerer with maximized physical abilities, it was merely unusual not incomprehensible. After all, he recognized his identity immediately upon seeing him. But that tennis ball-headed kid was different. I can't figure it out. A kid with vivid green hair like a tennis ball, looking directly at him with ordinary gray eyes. Satoru Goho couldn't quite grasp what that child was. So, to learn more about him, Goho took off his sunglasses that obscured his six eyes and observed the being fully. He was a non-sorcerer. To the six eyes, the child appeared no different from any ordinary non-sorcerer walking down the street. His cursed energy was exceptionally calm, but that was probably because he wasn't in any particularly negative emotional state when he met Goho. No talisman, no curse was visible. All that could be seen was the minimal amount of cursed energy present in every non-sorcerer. To Goho, the child was just one among the countless non-sorcerers overflowing this earth. The six eyes gave him that information. However, Satoru Goho's intuition no, his soul spoke differently. Strong. This child is strong. But no matter how much he observed, he couldn't articulate where that strength lay, nor why the child was strong. The same goes for the sword that guy had. To the six eyes, it appeared as an ordinary katana, not a cursed tool. Yet, from that sword, he felt the same aura as from a child. Until now, Satoru Goho never needed to ponder why any being was strong or weak. It was simply visible to the six eyes. But with the child and his sword, nothing was visible. There was only an intuition, uncertain of its truth. For the first time in his life, Satoru Goho encountered the unknown. He wanted to know. That's why he asked, what are you? If that non-sorcerer gorilla hadn't intervened, I might have gotten an answer. Suddenly infuriated, Satoru clenched his teeth. Then, he abruptly stood up and yelled. Who interrupts when someone is talking and runs away? Just let him be caught. Watching Satoru pacing around the classroom in a frenzy, Ieri Shoko looked on with indifference. Why is he like that again? Well, it's Satoru, isn't it? I'll find out. Just you watch. Jito glanced away from Goho, who was throwing uppercuts at the air, and fixed his gaze back on his book. Two months had passed since enrolling in Tokyo Jujutsu High and becoming a sorcerer, but adapting to the unique madness of his peer was still a work in progress. For now. Five days later, at 4 a.m. Hello? When Toji Zenin opened the door in response to the knock, there stood Satoru Goho. Wrapped in the armory summon, Goho, wearing sunglasses to cover his bloodshot six eyes, briefly stared at the grinning face of Satoru Goho, before calmly shutting the door. Bang. Hey. Open the door. Do you have any idea what I went through to find this place over the past few days? Open up, open the door. Toji ignored the shouting from behind the door and went inside. Zaro, who had sensed Goho's presence with his observation hockey and had woken up, was standing by, having already changed into his outdoor clothes, and strapped the Waito Ichimanji to his waist, ready for any unexpected situations. Zaro glanced at Toji and asked, what did he say? He said hello. At 4 a.m., just shows up at someone's house? Exactly. Crazy guy. All sorcerers are crazy, but this one's uniquely nuts. How he even found the address is beyond me. Should I have moved immediately after that encounter with him? Or should I leave Tokyo now? The banging on the door with fists continued, causing Megumi, who was asleep, to grimace and whine. Ugh. He seemed like he was about to wake up. Feeling anxious, Toji quickly picked up Megumi and soothed him in a low voice. Hush, hush. Let's keep sleeping, Megumi. But without any sense of being comforted, Megumi's eyes snapped open. Papa, Papa, it's okay, Megumi. Just a crazy no, someone came by. It'll be quiet soon. I'm scared. Huh, you uh. He's crying. Damn it. Megumi usually slept through anything, but once awake, he often cried. Stopping his tears and putting him back to sleep could easily take an hour. Which meant, at least for the next hour, Zaro and Toji's sleep was gone. That bastard. Frustration bubbled within him. How many people's sleep had been disturbed because of that guy? Toji carefully handed Megumi over to Zoro. Zoro comforted Megumi while still looking towards the door that was being banged on. Should we call the police? That'll just make Megumi even less able to sleep. The sound of police sirens would only add to the noise, and the police would have questions about the report. Meanwhile, that lunatic wouldn't likely stay quiet. What do we do then? Let's take a gamble. That guy seemed pretty tired too, so maybe it would work. Toji recalled the bloodshot six eyes he had seen earlier. And when he sensed Goho Satoru with his observation hockey, he hadn't detected the Limitless. Limitless is a technique with the highest defensive power, but that's only when the technique is activated. Toji walked up and opened the door again. 
Goho Satoru's bloodshot six eyes glared back at him. Finally opened up, damn gorilla. Hey, is that tennis ball kid inside? Let me see thump. Toji's large hand grabbed Goho by his fluffy white hair. That's when Goho realized he had forgotten to activate the limitless. Toji smirked wickedly. It's not okay to visit a house with a kid at dawn, you damn fool. Uh, whoosh. With all his might, Toji flung Goho Satoru far away. A scream echoed as Goho's form flew into the dimly lit alley and disappeared. Toji dusted off his hands and closed the door. Now that the disturbance was dealt with, it was time to soothe Megumi. It took two hours for Megumi to finally stop crying and fall asleep. It was already past 6 a.m., so he'd likely wake up again soon. Zoro looked at the sleeping Megumi, sighed briefly, and then turned to Toji to ask, What about that guy? I threw him. Will he come back? Probably. Is that guy an enemy of yours? Not yet. But he might become one. The probability of becoming an enemy was high if he knew Toji was a sorcerer killer, but surprisingly, not many people were aware of that fact. Only Zoro, Xiu Kong, and a few clients who had directly hired Toji knew about it. Xiu Kong, being a broker, knows better than anyone that blabbing would shorten his own life. Zoro wouldn't go around talking about it either. Despite becoming quite chatty around Megumi, Zoro naturally didn't talk much. Clients would likely keep it to themselves too. Talking about Toji would mean admitting to hiring him for assassinations. However, in their world, the infamy of a sorcerer killer wasn't exactly secret, so there was no guarantee that Toji's past wouldn't eventually reach Goho Satoru. Hard to say how he'd react then. He might have already known and come looking. Zoro calmly asked, should we move? You like this house, don't you? We don't have to sell it, we could just move. Rent it out, or buy a new house in the new neighborhood. Money wasn't an issue. Since returning home, Toji hadn't been to the gambling dens, so nearly all the money they had saved was still there. I seem to be reluctant to spend that money, though. If that's the case, living in a rented apartment would be an option. Toji could certainly afford the rent, no matter what job he takes on. Zaro would like to help out with work too if he could, but in this country, the idea of a child his age working would alarm just about anyone. It's true that he likes their current house, but he has no intention of risking Toji and Megumi's safety to stay there. It's frustrating that running away without fighting back seems like the best option, but for Zoro, the lives of his family are much more valuable than his pride or desire to win. But simply running away also didn't suit Zoro's temperament, so he proposed a compromise. How about we see how things go? We don't know if that guy really considers you an enemy or not. If he turns out to be an enemy, they'd leave immediately, if not, they'd hear him out. Plus, from what I saw, that guy seemed more interested in me than in you. Goho Satoru had been focusing on Zoro at that time. It was only after Toji intervened that he paid him any attention. Toji's expression hardened, so Zoro waved his hand dismissively. He didn't seem hostile. It's still dangerous. You've got me. Based on Zoro's observation with observation hockey, if Toji and Goho Satoru were to face off one-on-one, -on -one, Toji would clearly have the upper hand. Moreover, if it's just about running away from Goho with Zoro, it would be even easier for Toji. It might be a bit difficult with Megumi, though. Megumi could be left with a babysitter for a while. They just needed to keep him out of Goho's sight for a bit, and if they needed to flee, they could pick him up from the babysitters and escape. And I'm not so weak myself. Zaro's armament hockey wasn't something to be easily breached. Even if he couldn't win, he wouldn't die. I'd personally like to talk to that guy too. He was curious. Meeting someone as powerful as Toji was a first in this lifetime. Toji sighed. He had not withdrawn his observation hockey from Goho, so he knew that Goho didn't harbor any particular hostility towards Toji and Zoro. However, he still didn't like the idea of such a powerful figure approaching his children. He was worried about not being able to protect them. If I lose them again. He couldn't even imagine what would happen to himself. It would be better to die before losing them. He managed to do it once, but he couldn't do it twice. Never twice. Stop with the unnecessary thoughts. Snap. Zaro flicked his finger near Toji's ear. The sudden sound forcibly cleared his thoughts. How do you know what I'm thinking? It's obvious. There wasn't much left that was meaningful enough for Toji to think about. If you're that worried, stay alert. And let's take Megumi to the babysitter's house as soon as he wakes up. I think he'll come back today. He's coming today? Just a hunch. And at 4 p.m. that day, just as Zoro predicted, Satoru Goho came back to the house. At 4 p.m. that day, Goho Satoru came back to the house. Hello, gorilla. Having had a good rest, Goho Satoru's face looked much better. The six eyes visible beyond his sunglasses sparkled, and he was carefully wrapped in limitless. It seemed like he was grinding his teeth at Toji, but that was to be expected. When has the young lord of the Goho family ever been grabbed by the hair and thrown away? 
Moreover, calling him a gorilla, it seemed there was no difference between the Zenin and the Goho, in treating him like a beast. The corner of Toji's mouth twisted sarcastically. Satoru, it's rude to call people gorillas. This time, he brought another person with him. Glancing, Toji looked at the sorcerer standing next to Goho Satoru. Hello, I'm Jito Suguru. The young male sorcerer with one strand of hair falling forward and the rest coiled up strangely was someone he had seen at the zoo before. Toji looked at the sorcerer, who was giving a benevolent smile, and assessed him. This guy is pretty strong too. Only slightly weaker than Goho Satoru. At this level, he was likely a grade 1 sorcerer, at the very least a semi-grade 1. Moreover, although he wasn't sure what kind of technique it was, when Toji activated his observation hockey, he felt a lot of presences around this guy, not just him. It was bustling. Toji frowned. This feeling was. Cursed spirits? Since this sorcerer himself wasn't a cursed spirit, it seemed likely that his technique involved cursed spirit manipulation. Cursed spirit manipulation. A technique that involves capturing subdued cursed spirits and controlling them. Although the number and grade of cursed spirits a sorcerer can capture and control, vary greatly among sorcerers. Still, it's a pretty good technique. Toji had hardly ever sensed a sorcerer with such a technique through observation hockey, so he couldn't be sure if it was indeed cursed spirit manipulation. If we fight what would happen? Toji acknowledged that Zoro stated he was stronger than Goho, but that was only in a one-on-one -on -one scenario. If the other side truly was a grade 1 cursed spirit manipulator, they might end up fighting dozens against one, if unlucky. Of course, if the captured spirits were of a lower grade, it might just be a case of quantity over quality. Though there were two on this side, including Zoro, Toji had no intention of letting Zoro face these individuals. Absolutely not. Goho barged in eagerly, interrupting their thoughts. Enough about that, where's that tennis ball headed kid umph? Satoru says he has something to say to the kid in this house. Can we come in? Umph? Umph? Jetu naturally covered Satoru's mouth and asked politely. However, Toji easily noticed Jetu's glance briefly shift towards the storage cursed object Toji was wearing. Although his smile seemed friendly at first glance, it was cold enough to turn hostile at any moment. It seems like he's wearing a mask. Young sorcerers from the high school weren't going to fool Toji that easily. Well, fine. They were also ready to stab and run at any moment. Toji thought about the natural hairbrush inside the storage cursed object and the escape routes he had planned, making way for them to come in. Goho, having his hand slapped away by Jetu, grumbled. This should have been done earlier. Anyway. Satoru casually threw his shoes off and entered the house. One shoe flew into the house, causing Toji to frown. Jetu Suguru, while remaining tense, neatly arranged his shoes. Toji didn't take his eyes off them as he closed the door and, without looking, kicked Goho's stray shoe back towards the entrance. Inside, Zaro was sitting alone on the sofa. Megumi was at the babysitter's, not here. Goho Satoru and Zoro's eyes met. The moment he met those ordinary gray eyes, devoid of any trace of cursed energy, Goho Satoru felt a chill. As I thought. He wasn't mistaken. Still, only an ordinary non-sorcerer without any distinguishing features was visible to the six eyes. Yet, Goho Satoru's soul kept signaling and warning him. Strong. The person before him is strong. Though. He couldn't for the life of him understand why. For the first time in his life, Goho Satoru felt fear, curiosity, and tension towards the unknown. That's why, even after spending nights wandering around for the past five days, he urgently sought the answer he wanted to hear as soon as possible. What's the answer? What are you? Zaro was at a loss for words right now. So, with a deeply furrowed brow, he sat on the sofa, looking up at Goho Satoru. You're asking me what I am? Yes. You came here just to hear the answer to that question? At someone's house, and at four in the morning, no less? Of course. Why else would I have spent several nights searching all over Tokyo? Goho declared proudly, hands on his hips. Then, pointing a finger at Toji, he exclaimed. If that gorilla hadn't interfered, I could have gotten an answer from you earlier. It was madness, but Zoro accepted it. After all, in his previous life, Zaro was part of a crew of madmen known as pirates, even considered the craziest among a group that was already deemed insane by its members. Keep your voice down in front of the kid, Satoru. Jito gave Zoro, who was sitting in front of Goho, a troubled look. Goho had insisted they visit because he found the child he saw before, and wanted Jito to come along, but Jito couldn't understand what business Goho could possibly have with such a young child. As before, to Jito's eyes, Zoro looked far too young. Perhaps six or seven years old. Although he wore a sword, he seemed too young to wield it. Jito smiled gently, bending down to meet Zoro's gaze, and said in a kind voice, Hello. I'm Jito Suguru. You can call me Jito, Suguru, or just bro if you like. Uh. Have you met me in Satoru before? 
Zaro shrugged his shoulders. For you, this is the second meeting, but for that guy, it's the third. He came here at 4 a.m. today. Jito looked at his classmate with a mix of horror and disdain. Goho bristled in response. What's with that look, Suguru? Satoru, you Jito sighed deeply, shaking his head in disbelief. Sorry, I'll apologize on his behalf. So, oh, I don't know your name yet. What's your name? Zaro didn't think too hard before answering. I'm Zaro. Zenin Zaro. Ha? Huh? Zenin? Zenin? Goho jumped up from his seat, and Toji flinched. Even Jito trailed off, saying, Zenin? Could it be Zoro blinked, not understanding why everyone was reacting so strongly. The six eyes sparkled. Are you a member of the Zenin clan? That gorilla also carries the Zenin name. Are both of you? The Zenin clan? What, you don't know? You're carrying that name without knowing? Speak so I can understand. Zoro got annoyed, and Goho looked back at Toji. Hey, gorilla. Haven't you told him what Zenin means? I can understand if the kid doesn't know, but you surely know what the Zenin clan is. Not your biological child? Were you originally from the Zenin clan and then kidnapped or adopted him, don't talk carelessly about my father. Zoro cut Goho off sharply. Both Zoro's gray eyes and voice dropped coldly at the same time. He had no intention of fighting, but he also wasn't going to let Toji be insulted openly without saying anything. The overt and cold threat from the childlike Zoro made Jito's eyes widen. Goho opened his mouth wide in shock. Could he actually be your real father? Really? Your hair is even green. So what? You don't resemble him at all. Neither you nor the people of Zenin. It's strange. Gathering them together, they sort of give off a similar vibe, which seems to be a trait of that household. Goho muttered. Zaro, not understanding the conversation, looked at Toji. Toji's face was stern, and he moved his lips slightly. Later. If that's the case, Zaro was indifferent. It seems related to father's past, but he wasn't curious about that. For a long while after Goho Satoru's explanation, Zaro listened with one ear and let it go out the other. Being naturally indifferent to others and lacking concentration on uninteresting topics, Zaro yawned with a look of indifference. Noticing this, Goho Satoru leaned in close to Zoro's face. Hey, tennis ball. You didn't listen to a word I just said, did you? It's not tennis ball, it's Zoro. Ugh. Satoru scratched his white hair vigorously. Zoro thought he looked just like a flustered chicken. Goho, don't lose your temper with a child. It's natural for children to have less concentration than adults. Jito scolded him. Zoro, unsure whether to join in or get angry, ultimately chose not to react at all. With a loud sigh, Goho then said boastfully, fine. I'll ask you a simple question that even a dumb kid like you can understand. Huh, what did you just say to my son, are you strong? Toji fell silent, and Zoro raised his eyebrows. Was he knowledgeable about something, or just probing? Seemingly having received his answer from the silence, Goho shrugged. I thought so. My eyes are special, you see. They can see through most things. The mystical blue eyes peeked through the fluttering white eyelashes before revealing themselves again. But you and your sword, I can't see anything special with my eyes. A regular non-sorcerer and a regular sword without any cursed energy. A combination that shouldn't possess any strength. Yet, my instincts, my soul, tell me something completely different. You are strong. Goho Satoru stated decisively. Toji felt tense, but Zoro remained calm. It was to be expected. Just as Toji had recognized Zoro, strong beings recognize each other. I would have been somewhat disappointed if they hadn't noticed at all. Because it would seem the strongest in this world are only this much. You already know the basics about sorcerers and cursed spirits, right? Your lineage, the Zenin clan, along with the Goho and Kamo clans, have been considered prestigious families in the world of sorcerers for a very long time. And that place, they really like talent. Goho put on his sunglasses again and rinned. I'm not exactly sure how old this kid is. But it seems certain he was under 10 years old. If Goho judged him to be strong at that age, then he would have been a once in several hundreds of years genius even in the prestigious three great families. Zaro clearly showed no interest. I'm not interested. You might not be interested in that. But would the people of the Zenin clan immediately try to take you to their family? No. Toji, who had been leaning against a wall and listening silently, interjected. Toji walked over and plopped down next to Zoro, wrapping an arm around his shoulder. It was unclear whether he was trying to protect him or ready to flee with him at a moment's notice. Probably both. What's wrong with what I said, gorilla? The Zenin clan will never register this kid in their family register. They should be thankful just to acknowledge his existence. Thinking that the Zenin clan would want to register Zoro just because he has talent is indeed a thought process fitting for a sheltered young master. Of course, Zoro is strong. He has talent. Toji had no intention of denying that. However, Zoro is not what they are looking for. 
The ultimate candidate the Zenin clan wants is a male sorcerer with 10 shadows technique. Even if one is strong or talented, if they are not male or a sorcerer, they will not be accepted and will be rejected. Toji was living proof of that. Toji guessed that Goho Satoru was unaware of such rejection. Because he never had to face rejection in his life. From birth, he was exactly what they revered and acknowledged the most. The owner of the Six Eyes, born into the Goho clan for the first time in 400 years, and his technique was the Limitless Curse technique. That was everything the clan could have hoped for. From the moment of his birth, he would have been designated as the clan head, and all of the Goho clan's resources would have been poured into Goho Satoru. It was natural for Goho Satoru to be unaware of the existence of prejudice and disdain, having never experienced it. On the other hand, Zen and Toji knew all too well about the unique prejudices, rejections, and disdain of the sorcery world. That's why he never wanted his own children to go through such experiences. That's why he had been keeping Zoro from facing cursed spirits lately, but in the end, they were discovered by a sorcerer. It happened too soon. He hadn't thought they could hide Zoro from the eyes of the sorcery world forever. However, it happened much sooner than expected. Now, two sorcerers, Goho Satoru and that Forlock sorcerer, already knew about Zoro's existence. The sorcery world is small. Just a word from them to one or two people, and rumors would spread across the entire sorcery world in no time. It might be quiet for a while. But for how long? A month? Or two months? A non-sorcerer at just five years old being strong. Those two might just find Zoro curious without any aversion towards him. But most sorcerers wouldn't react the same way. They would question how a non-sorcerer could be stronger than a sorcerer, ignore, dislike, slander, doubt, and reject them. In the worst case, they might even try to erase his existence altogether. As his thoughts reached that point, an instinctive killing intent flared up inside Zen and Toji, as if lighting a lighter. If only these two were gone. If he eliminates these two now and moves far away, Zoro might be able to avoid the sorcery world's attention for at least a few years. Zoro is getting stronger every day, and by the time he's 10, even the old folks at the headquarters won't stand a chance against him. This area is all residential for non-sorcerers. It's not a place where sorcerers can recklessly cause commotion and use destructive techniques. Plus, the geography of this area, down to each alley, was all in Toji's head. If it came to a fight, the odds were in their favor. What are you looking at, gorilla? At Goho's gruff words, Toji unconsciously relaxed the fist he didn't realize he was clenching. Although they lack manners, luck, and politeness, these two haven't shown any hostility towards either Zoro or Toji, and certainly not towards Megumi. Simply for the reason of irritating Toji, killing them wouldn't be right. I need to improve. For the sake of the children who would stay by my side no matter what. Toji gradually eased the murderous intent that had bloomed in his chest. As soon as his green eyes regained their calm, Goho spun around with a grin. Did you fall for me? I guess I am quite handsome. The murderous intent that Toji had just calmed flared up again within three seconds. Toji raised his fist, but seeing Goho clearly wrapped and limitless, he lowered it again. Unless it was a destructive type of cursed energy, Toji's level of cursed energy wouldn't be able to penetrate limitless. I should just throw him out of the house quickly. If he had to endure Goho's babbling any longer, he might actually shove a natural curse into his neck. If you're done talking, I'd appreciate it if you'd leave my house, Lord Goho of Limitless. Ha. Huh. And you're from the Zenin family. A physical gifted thanks to being a heavenly restriction with zero cursed energy. So, he really does have the six eyes. Not just an eye that reads the flow of cursed energy. Considering he knows exactly what Toji is, even though he has no cursed energy. Well, that must be why he sensed Toji standing behind him back then. Jetu clapped once. Let's all calm down. We can't spend all our time here chatting. Goho, how about we get to the point and leave? Goho made a grumbling sound. The main point, the main point. He originally came here out of curiosity. He wanted to see what kind of people could run away from Goho Satoru like that. For the first time, something appeared that even the six eyes couldn't discern, and a human being with no cursed energy appeared, both of which he wanted to see again. So, he found him again after spending all night searching. But even after seeing them again, I still don't really understand. He was sure they were strong. But why they were strong, or how strong they were, was still unclear. That was true for both the green-haired kid and Toji. Ah, uh, and there was one more thing he wanted to ask. Do you have a goal? Something you want to achieve? Goho Satoru was curious about what this strong kid wanted, and what his goal was, especially since he would become even stronger in the future given his age. The strongest. Zaro's response came immediately. Goho was momentarily stunned, then burst out laughing. Ah, haha. That's unfortunate. Because we are the strongest. Goho, don't get into a serious argument with a child. It's funny, Jetu. The strongest is us. You and me. 
Goho pointed to Jetu and himself in turn. Sigh, Jetu exhaled. Even so, he looked slightly proud and didn't deny it. Zaro didn't react much. Time would tell, after all. Goho stood up with a grunt. Anyway, it was interesting. Worth the VISIT there was still much he didn't know, and he wanted to learn more. Then I should see more of them. Goho Satoru came to a clear conclusion. How should he continue to see them? It would be troublesome for Goho and Jetu to come here every time. They were still students, but as sorcerers, being a sorcerer wasn't such a leisurely job. Then, the solution was to invite them to where Goho was. Tennis ball, gorilla. I told you, I'm not a tennis ball or a gorilla, you guys, come to Jujutsu High. This is an if side story unrelated to the main plot. Please skip this chapter if you don't like it. Tears warning if, Zaro had not met Toji that day. November 11, 2003. Like always, Zaro went out to look for Toji, who hadn't come home since Kai's death. And like always, he returned home without finding anything. But Zoro continued to leave home to search for Toji. The next day, and the day after that. I'm late in introducing myself. I'm Fushiguro Sakura. Zen and Toji looked intently at the woman introducing herself. She was tall but had flawed skin, with freckles and pimples visible on her cheeks. Her nose was slightly crooked, and most importantly, she wasn't Toji's type. However, none of that mattered. This was a marriage meant to find a woman who could take care of the kids in place of Toji, who changed his surname and didn't come home. In that regard, this woman named Fushiguro was passable. She had no complaints about marrying into the family as a son-in-law, didn't take her frustrations out on the kids unnecessarily. She already had a somewhat grown daughter, and she consistently came home. I'm Zen and Toji. Above all, his taste had already become something he could never encounter again. Neither others nor anything else mattered. Zen and Toji lived his life with this mindset. Gambled every day, sweet-talked women into sleeping with him, took on jobs to kill people when money ran low, and gambled again with that money. It was a life like a hamster wheel. The more he spun, the deeper he sank into the mire, perhaps even hell. Occasionally, he thought of his green-haired son and an infant who couldn't even walk, but Toji forcibly pushed those memories out of his mind. They had a house to live in, and he sent living expenses whenever he had money. That was already a much better environment than the one Toji grew up in. He didn't contact the Zenin clan, so Megumi probably had to live as a sorcerer without the clan's support, but it was probably better to be with Zoro. The clan might not welcome Zoro, unlike Megumi. Now, it was all meaningless. Whether it was his children, his new wife, or money. He would just live this way until the end came. An end fitting for trash that rolled in hell. That too, would be meaningless. And that end came on the day Toji remembered the name of his second son, which he had forgotten. Any last words? As Goho Satoru asked calmly, Toji responded just as calmly. None. Even if there were, it wasn't something to say to the young lord before him. Confused by the inexplicable thoughts, Toji was momentarily disoriented. At the brink of death, who was there to listen to his words? Seeing Toji remain silent, Goho left the scene. Perhaps he went to seek out a spirit manipulator colleague or to find a growth subject. After all, Toji, now just a corpse, posed no threat. Toji staggered a few steps before collapsing against a wall. Unable to comprehend the situation himself, Toji touched the gash on his side, then weakly dropped his hand. Fushiguro Toji was still alive. He lived with all his might. For what purpose? Now, there was nothing left for him. What on earth was he trying to do? Tap, tap. There was the sound of small footsteps. They suddenly stopped as if frozen in place, then quickly approached Toji. He could hardly hear anything. Only a strange buzzing sound like insects flying reached him, causing Toji to blink. When he came to a bit, his blurry vision caught a glimpse of a kid with green hair shaking his collar violently. In his drowsy state, Toji slightly furrowed his brow. He had seen him somewhere. Who was it again? Come to. The heck. Toji. Wake up dad. Take care of Zoro and Megumi for me. Ah. It was Zoro. You're here. But you shouldn't be. Faced with this surreal scene, Toji reached out his hand towards Zoro's head. The coarse green hair touched his hand, staining the grass-like color with drops of blood. Zaro saw the large hole in Toji's torso and the blood oozing out thickly and cursed. You, damn it. After not showing your face for years, what the hell is this mess? Amid the cries mixed with despair and rage, Toji realized. This is real. The Zoro in front of him was real. Numerous thoughts floated through Toji's mind, only to drip away like flowing blood. How he got here, what he was doing here, whether he knew that he was dying. Things like that. At that moment, the question Goho Satoru had asked him calmly earlier brushed through Toji's mind. Do you have any last words? Ah. I see. Toji's body had desperately clung to life just for this moment. To leave words behind for his son, who had finally found him. What should I say? 
when there's nothing left but to die. Zaro's hands, covered in blood, trembled. Who is it, exactly who did this to you? Do you plan to, avenge me? Who would avenge someone like you? Zaro yelled as if he was choked up. Toji faintly smiled. Right, don't do it. Don't bother with avenging me. There's no reason for Zoro to be burdened by such a thing. After all, he was a father who might have been better off not being there. Toji cupped Zoro's face with his only hand. It was much bigger than the last time he remembered. Still small, though. Live. Toji said calmly. Don't end up like me. Both of you. That's all there is to it. I don't deserve to ask for more. I couldn't even be there for them as a parent. What right do I have to meddle in how Zoro and Megumi live their lives? His strength drained hand slipped away. Even until the last moment, showing such a state as a father, Zaro held that hand. Regrettably, Toji could no longer feel the warmth of the small hand. It's the end. All of it. His eyelids grew heavy. Zaro, sensing this, gripped Toji's hand tightly, veins bulging on his hand. Still, no sensation came through. Zaro's lips quivered. Toji's entire attention focused on the last words he would hear in his life. Toji's eyes widened to their limit upon hearing Zoro's words. A mix of incredulity and pity leaped through a faint laugh. Really, Zoro was consistent to the very end. And so blood trickled down from the corner of his mouth. Toji tapped Zoro's cheek lightly. For someone like me you should be cursing. Zoro. Everything felt unbearably heavy. Breathing was difficult, Toji struggled to swallow his breath and closed his eyes. And then, everything faded to white. Zoro silently observed Toji, who had just breathed his last in front of him. The face of the father he had seen for the first time in years, aside from being bloodied, was not much different from the last time he had seen him. That made it all the more unbelievable. Damned bastard. Zaro spat out the words as if cursing. His stomach churned. When I met Toji again, I wanted to be angry at him. I wanted to punish him, confront him, blame him to my heart's content, and beat him up thoroughly. Why did you leave us? Do you know how hard it was for me? After you left like that, for a while, I couldn't even find Shia's grave. If you weren't going to come home after getting married, why did you marry at all? Megumi doesn't even know your face. The woman you married hasn't been coming home recently either. Do you even know what has happened up until now? But all of that was meaningless to a dead person. What is this mess, this mess? If he had been living well, I could have given him a piece of my mind. If he had completely forgotten about us, I could have stomped on him to make him remember everything. Toji left them and died miserably without gaining anything. Making it impossible for Zoro to be angry or to blame him and impossible to bring him back by his side. You're the worst, you know. Really, the absolute worst. For a long time, Zaro sat and silently watched the dead Toji. Then, at some moment, he stood up. And, he picked up the already lifeless body of Toji. The weight was too much for a child to handle, and Zaro's body momentarily staggered. As the cursed spirit tried to slip off Toji's body as if trying to escape, Zaro bit down on the tail of the spirit to prevent it from running away. It's heavy. It's heavy. Drip, drop. A lot of blood flowed from the open wound. Zaro looked at the red stains it made and then turned his gaze away in pain. Step by step. Zaro struggled to carry Toji and took one step forward. And then another step, and yet another. Finally, it was the end. Silence lingered. Goho Satoru was wearing an expression that seemed to ask, well? Without even knowing what he had just proposed, while Zoro rolled his eyes in disbelief. The fellow sorcerer companion awkwardly laughed with an ahaha. No. You crazy bastard. Zen and Toji forcibly swallowed the words that followed. Toji stood up and flung the door wide open, then grabbed the napes of the two guys and dragged them along. It was lucky for both that they had deactivated their limitless. If it had been active, Toji would have considered embedding heavenly pheasants in their bodies to drag them out if necessary. If you're done talking, then leave. I don't wanna woe, why are you so strong? You're incredibly fast too. Um, can I just walk out on my own? No. Zen and Toji heaved them up and threw them out the open door. Goho Satoru's scream of ack. And some protesting voices could be heard, but just like before, Toji didn't give a damn, and slammed the door shut. I'll be back here in three days at this time. Goho yelled from outside the door. Before an infuriated Toji could respond, Goho and his companion quickly disappeared. Toji massaged his throbbing forehead. It was ridiculous that these heavenly pheasants were giving him a headache. But given that guy's personality, it was impossible not to have a headache. Crazy bastard. While it said all sorcerers are mad, this one was truly, deeply mad. It's as if he sold his sanity to a curse. You guys, come to Jujutsu High. Such an out of the blue suggestion was unexpected. Well, considering his fellow sorcerer looked just as shocked, there probably wasn't any discussion with the school authorities. No, it was certain that Goho hadn't even thought about making them come to Jujutsu High before arriving here. 
He just blurted it out as the idea came to him. I should have known from the moment he screamed at the door at 4 a.m. in a house with a child that he was the craziest of the crazy. Exhaustion surged. Toji wanted to lie down on the sofa, but he had to pick up Megumi from the babysitter's house first. They should all have dinner together. Zaro scurried up to Toji's side. Tired? A bit. For Toji, meeting Goho Satoru twice in one day was too much. He was too crazy. Zaro, who had a much higher tolerance for madness than Toji, didn't feel particularly tired. If he got tired from this much, he wouldn't have lasted a day with his crew. Zaro glanced at Toji. Dislike it? Those guys? Of course, I dislike them. Not them. Going to Jujutsu High. Toji was at a loss for words. After a moment of thought, he pulled Zoro into his embrace while still lying down. Zoro didn't resist and let himself be pulled in. The warm heat and Zoro's unique body scent filled the air. The smell of metal and blood reminiscent of blades mixed with the scent of sweat and the artificial floral fragrance of fabric softener. What do you think? Dislike it? It's not about liking or disliking. You and I can't go to Jujutsu High. At least, not now. Zoro tilted his head. Why? You're too young. It's hard to believe given how mature and strong he is, but Zoro is only about 5 years old. Considering the typical age for first-year students entering Jujutsu High is 15, sometimes 16 if they've repeated a year, it's almost a decade too early for him. And Jujutsu High isn't just a simple high school. It's a place that assigns missions to its affiliated sorcerers. From the perspective of a high school and as a place that assigns missions, it's not suitable for Zoro to go to Jujutsu High now. If Goho Satoru invited Zoro to Jujutsu High with the immediate intention of deploying him as a sorcerer in the field, Toji swore he would drive a spike into Goho Satoru's white skull. He's not even a sorcerer, to begin with. He's someone who doesn't need to dive into the world of sorcery at all. Toji desperately wished to belong to that world, but Zoro could be different. After all, there are many sorcerers who want to leave the world of sorcery. Even if it's okay later, he might not want to enter it now. The mention of missions made Zoro frown. Who assigns these missions? Do sorcerers choose the missions they want and get paid upon completion, like bounties? No. The Jujutsu headquarters assigns them based on rank to each sorcerer. So, it's basically an order? Yes. Zaro leaned against Toji with a face that lost all its enthusiasm. Then I'm out. I don't like being ordered around by someone else. I won't listen anyway. Except when it's an order from Luffy. If the work at Jujutsu High involved following someone's orders to exterminate curses, Zaro had no business being there. Absolutely not. His interest dropped instantly. Zaro looked at Toji and asked, I mean, that's what I think, but what about you? Do you want to go to Jujutsu High? I need to be by your side. The corner of Zoro's mouth twisted. It looked like an expression of displeasure, or as if he was saying not to lie. Tell me the truth. Toji clicked his tongue. Only sharp when it comes to this. Can observation hockey red minds too? Well, my hockey isn't like that. Even Luffy, who was specialized in sensing emotions, couldn't do that. However, Zaro could sense if someone was hiding something. It was closer to intuition and experience than observation hockey. Toji sighed. His eldest Moss Head son had a good sense only in times like these. How great would it be if that sense could be applied to finding directions? I don't know. Thoughts of it's too late now and it's not too late crossed his mind simultaneously. The idea of being acknowledged and living without shame by his children's side, regardless of the sorcerer world, seemed ironic now that such an opportunity had come. It felt empty to see the world he had struggled to enter open up with just a word from the Goho family's young master. That must have been a thoughtless remark from Goho. Probably. Zaro agreed. But he's not the type to take back what he said. Zaro had observed Goho's eyes intensely when he made that offer. There was no hesitation or deceit in those sky-blue eyes. Only an unbreakable pride in the arrogance of believing he could achieve whatever he wanted. Whether it was a spur of the moment or for some other reason, once he had voiced the offer, Toji knew Goho wouldn't back down, saying he never said such a thing. He would push forward regardless of any opposition. He's a person overflowing with vigor and talent. And also someone who has never faced failure. He would be invaluable as an ally. Of course, there are things that talent and vigor alone can't overcome, so someday he will face a painful failure, but that's not now. If you want to go, you can. Don't talk nonsense. I won't leave you too. This was Toji's sincere belief. He might have been wavering, but he really had no intention of going to Jujutsu High. What would he do at his age? Become a student or a teacher with no cursed energy? It was enough for Zoro to look after Megumi alone that one time. Besides, if Zoro were left alone and went out to buy something the thought of Zoro wandering around Tokyo asking, where am I? Made his vision blur. He couldn't stand to see that. Absolutely not. And there's another thing. 
Toji had something else to tell Zoro, about the Zenin clan that Goho had mentioned earlier. He couldn't just let it pass as if nothing had happened. Zoro had already heard about the Zenin clan from Goho. Of course, it seemed like Zoro hadn't paid much attention to even half of what Goho explained, but still. About the Zenin clan that guy mentioned earlier as he spoke, Toji wet his dry lips with his tongue, unsure of how to explain. The things they had done to him, and the things he had done to them. However, Zoro had the right to know. It was a surname Toji had arbitrarily given him, after all. So, despite his hesitation, Toji continued. The Zenin are, if you don't want to talk about it, you don't have to. Zoro interrupted with a nonchalant tone. Toji quickly looked up. Really? Yeah. I'm not interested. In his previous life, Zoro was a pirate who had spread fear and infamy across the world. In such a position, he wasn't one to pry into someone else's past. He wasn't interested. He found it odd to use the Zenin name while disliking the Zenin clan, but there must be a reason. He didn't plan to dig deeper. However, there was one thing he needed to know. Is the Zenin clan, like, your enemy? Ha! Huh? They're not even worth it. Then that settled it. With that answer, Zaro dropped all interest in the Zenin clan. They had decided neither of them would go to Jujutsu High, and the Zenin weren't worth their attention. Zaro neatly sorted out the situation in his mind, let go of Toji's arm, and got off the sofa. Then he reached out his hand. Let's go pick up Megumi. We need to go now if we want to have dinner together. Alright. Not being able to enter the world of sorcerers was fine. That alone was more than enough for Toji. Leaving behind his faded dreams, Toji took his eldest son's hand. The lukewarm warmth was ticklish. That day, to appease Megumi, who was pouting after being left with the babysitter, they bought his favorite pork ginger fry. With a sulky expression, Megumi stuffed his cheeks full of ginger. It was an ordinary peaceful evening, just like any other. Three days later, Goho Satoru went to Toji's house, humming to himself, only to be struck by a bolt from the blue. You're not going to the academy? Both of you? That's right. Why? It's our choice. If you're a sorcerer, you should come to the academy. Well, too bad, we're not sorcerers. Toji responded indifferently. Toji is a zero-cursed energy physical prodigy, and Zaro is a non-sorcerer. Neither had any obligation to enroll in the academy. Goho Satoru clenched his teeth. His eyes ominously gleamed, and then he flopped down on the floor. I'm not going. If you two aren't going, neither am I. Really a madman I don't care, I won't go. I won't go. Goho Satoru flailed his limbs. Toji looked at Goho Satoru with a look of disdain. It was no different from a child he once saw in a supermarket, mopping the floor with his back, begging his mother to buy him a Digimon coloring book. No, it was worse. Because of the limitless, he wasn't even touching the floor, so he couldn't even mop the floor with his clothes. It was fortunate they had left Megumi with the babysitter ahead of time. This kind of behavior should not be learned. I won't go. Until you say you'll go, I won't. I won't go. Looking at Goho Satoru throwing a tantrum in the middle of the living room, Zaro and Toji's expressions simultaneously crumpled. Toji seriously considered. Is it now? Is this the moment to kill the one who would become the next strongest in the sorcerer world? Today, unlike three days ago, the sorcerer specialized in spirit manipulation wasn't there. If Zoro hadn't been watching, Toji might have already killed him. Just as Toji was about to extract a heavenly moth from the spirit's mouth, Goho suddenly sat up. Why? Why exactly won't you come? I have to take care of a kid. I don't like taking orders from others. Goho let out a hollow laugh at the two responses that came almost simultaneously. Wow, really I don't like doing missions either, you know? Then don't do them. Who are you trying to make hesitate here feeling like talking to Zoro was getting nowhere, Goho turned to Toji. Hey gorilla. Are you really not coming? I've got a kid to take care of. Not even if we don't assign you any missions? You mean no missions? It's not just sorcerers who do missions at the academy. It also shelters young sorcerers with nowhere to go or those with physical sorceress anomalies until they grow up a bit. Then, when they're of age, they enroll. Goho's fifth year senior was precisely such a case. Abandoned by his parents at the age of eight for talking about strange things, he was taken in by Tokyo's Sorcery Academy. He grew up within the academy and naturally enrolled when he reached the age of 15. Toji sighed. The kid is only five years old. That's ten years younger than the typical age for enrolling in the academy. He's not even old enough for elementary school. Mission or not, it's unreasonable. Five years old? Really? Yes. Even you, born with Limitless and the Six Eyes, didn't start playing Sorcerer at that age. HMPH. But I did train in sorcery techniques. Goho Satoru grumbled a bit, but seemed a bit taken aback by the mention of five years old, his attitude softening. Seeing Zoro beginning to nod off, Goho spoke seriously. 
It'd be better to enter the sorcery world sooner rather than later, both for you and that kid. Even if you don't take on missions. Are you threatening me? It's advice. Excessive superiority creates enemies. Goho Satoru had a bounty worth hundreds of millions even before becoming an adult. Being a sorcerer promised to be the strongest in the future with the six eyes and limitless, many sought to nip his potential in the bud. This kid won't be any different. In that case, rather than constantly worrying about those around him getting caught up in endless assassinations and attacks among non-sorcerers, it might be better to come to the academy early and receive protection within Tenjin's barrier. At least, that was what Satoru thought. You might think you can raise that kid as a non-sorcerer, but it won't be easy. Goho Satoru attended a regular school for non-sorcerers during elementary and middle school, though it was the result of persistently defying the elders of his family. Although he was quite popular in school due to his doll-like appearance, he was ultimately an outsider there. What he knew and could do was different. What's natural for non-sorcerers isn't for sorcerers, and vice versa. Non-sorcerers can't understand the actions of sorcerers because they don't know, and sorcerers can't talk about it. Not only because of the sorcery regulations, but primarily because even if non-sorcerers knew, they couldn't do anything about it. Knowing about curses or sorcerers would only make non-sorcerers anxious and potentially create curses. The six eyes meticulously scanned Zoro's body. All that was visible was a young non-sorcerer. Yet, there was a sense of an unfamiliar aura. Given that Toji, physically gifted due to the heavenly restriction, must feel it too, Goho seriously asked him. Do you think a child you even feel is different can adapt among non-sorcerers? Toji looked solemnly at Goho Satoru for a moment before pointing towards the door with his finger. Don't meddle and leave. Yeah, yeah. I was about to go anyway. If you need to call, contact me here. Goho Satoru threw a note with his phone number on it. Toji contemplated throwing the paper back at that pretty face, but managed to hold back and picked it up instead. Goho then left, closing the door behind him. And for a while, there were no meetings between Goho Satoru, Zoro, and Toji. For a while, that is, Toji squatted down and looked at Megumi. What are you doing, Megumi? Doggy. Making a doggy. Megumi answered Toji and started scooping and piling up sand from the playground with a toy shovel enthusiastically. Since he seemed so happy, Toji couldn't bring himself to say that with such dry sand, it would be impossible to make something as complex as a dog. Well, as long as he's having fun. If told he couldn't make a dog, he would probably either burst into tears or insist he could. It was best just to leave him be. If he really wants to make a dog, I could get him some clay or something. But since he might still swallow the clay, it might be better to wait until after his third birthday to give it to him. Or perhaps a new doggy stuffed animal. Toji adjusted Megumi's hat, which was starting to come off, pressing it down properly. The weather in Tokyo in August was quite hot. They had come out early in the morning to avoid the heat, but letting him play energetically without caution could lead to him getting heatstruck. Megumi had grown quite a bit and gained a fair amount of weight. But to Toji, he was still light as a feather. Naturally, as he became more active, Toji and Zoro often let him play in the outdoor playground in front of their house. It was the easiest way to tire him out. Yesterday, he didn't sleep until 11 p.m., wanting to play tag. Judging by how he was playing today, he seemed likely to fall asleep early. Neither Toji nor Zoro were the type to get physically tired from playing children's games, but mental exhaustion was a different story. And childcare could be mentally exhausting, love for Megumi notwithstanding. And speaking of which, isn't it time for another vaccination? Babies needed many vaccinations. Zoro's vaccinations were mostly handled by Chie, and Toji, who had never been sick a day in his life, was unaware of such things. He decided to check the notebook when they got home. With that thought, Toji glanced away from Megumi and briefly looked at Zoro. 273, 274, 275 Zoro was doing pull-ups on the monkey bars. Zoro, hanging from the monkey bars and doing pull-ups with a serious expression after having flung off his t-shirt, looked honestly a bit odd even to his father, Toji. Zoro's amount of exercise had increased significantly. Apart from the time spent eating, sleeping, relieving himself, and playing with Megumi, he spent most of his time exercising. Consequently, he definitely built up some muscle. Whether a five-year-old needed muscles was another question. Lately, he had been sparring with Toji only about once every two weeks. He said he needed to practice controlling and utilizing his hockey on his own, without any guidance. 280, 281, 282, it seemed like the kind of training regimen reserved for young athletes preparing for national competitions. Even then, it would be rare for those kids to exercise to this extent. 299, 300, 301, 302, when Zoro didn't stop even after reaching 300, Toji sighed softly and got up. Walking over, Toji lifted Zoro, who was still hanging from the bar. 307 ah. 
Why are you doing this? It's too much for a kid your age to be overdoing it like this. Didn't you end up with muscle soreness last time because of this? Indeed, Zaro had suffered from both muscle and growth pains last week, overlapping in the night. I was wondering what was up when he was less responsive than usual in the morning. It was then Toji realized Zoro's entire body was soaked in sweat, which left him feeling somewhat stunned. He got better after a day of rest, being well-fed and well-rested, without any issues. If left unchecked, it could happen again. Zoro smacked his lips. I need to hit 500. 300 is plenty enough. Zoro was already experiencing a lot of growing pains due to his rapid growth, much faster than his peers. Toji didn't want to add muscle soreness to that. Because he doesn't show it. Even when in pain, Zaro wouldn't say he was hurting, and would stubbornly continue his strength training, so Toji had no choice but to intervene at an appropriate limit. Toji wished for nothing more than for Zaro not to be in pain or to suffer. Zaro, having put on his t-shirt, saw the concern that Toji couldn't fully hide on his face. Zaro was aware that Toji was worried about the intensity of his strength training. But I can't reduce the intensity of my training. To become stronger, maintaining at least that level of intensity was necessary. Though it hurt because of the growing pains and muscle soreness, what could he do? It was just a process of building muscle. That's the kind of person Zoro was. Someone who, despite any pain, hardship, or defeat, would not yield and would continue to take steps towards becoming stronger. Loving Toji wouldn't change, couldn't change those traits in Zoro. It was almost fundamental to who Zoro was as a person. Even if he died and was reborn several times, those core traits wouldn't bend or vanish. However, even Zoro had to pause when those traits seemed to hurt those around him. Especially if the person getting hurt was Toji. Because he had already suffered enough. Because of me. Does being your son make it hard for you? Zoro didn't voice this thought. Saying it out loud would only make Toji feel worse. Maybe I should reduce my exercise a bit for now. But then, my muscle growth will stall, Zoro pondered. Suddenly, Zoro and Toji both turned their heads in the same direction. A girl, who seemed a year or two older than Megumi, was cautiously approaching Megumi. The girl seemed weak, just an ordinary non-sorcerer child. There was no hostility just hesitation, yet she moved towards Megumi, who was playing in the sand, like a rabbit. Zoro and Toji exchanged glances and slowly walked towards Megumi. Megumi looked sullenly at the mound of sand he had built. It's not a puppy. Despite his efforts, nothing about the mound of sand Megumi created could be called a puppy. Maybe Papa or his brother could turn this mound of sand into a puppy. Thinking this, Megumi sprang to his feet, looking for Toji and Zoro. Oh. And then, their eyes met. A girl was standing in front of Megumi. The young girl with an innocent face looked at Megumi shyly, yet excitedly. Megumi had never encountered a girl his own age before. Chie, and all the caregivers he had encountered until now, were adults, and he had never been to kindergarten. Though he often saw other kids playing at the playground, it was just passing encounters. Green eyes wavered. He didn't know what to do. Hello. After he initiated the greeting, the girl's brown eyes widened. The girl with her dark brown hair tied back smiled warmly at Megumi. Seeing that, Megumi's face felt ticklish and warm. No, it was different from the warmth felt when the sun was high in the sky. It was similar to the feeling of diving into freshly laundered bedding, being tightly hugged by his brother, or having his hair stroked by Papa. Megumi didn't yet know the words to describe that sensation. It was a feeling of warmth. Hello? What's your name? Megumi. Megumi, that's pretty. Megumi's cheeks turned red. The brown eyes sparkled. Pretty, Megumi thought unwittingly. I'm Fushiguro Tsumiki. Tsumikai. The girl, Tsumiki, enunciated her name carefully. Then, with a slightly trembling voice, she asked Megumi, do you want to play with me? Together? Yeah. It's more fun to play together. Is that okay? Megumi had never played with anyone outside his family before. It felt unfamiliar and a bit scary. But, more than that, it was intriguing and pleasant. Toji and Zoro, who had approached by now, stood next to Megumi. Tsumiki politely greeted the two. Hello. Ah. Uh, what's your name? I'm Tsumiki. I'm Zoro. Toji. Nice to meet you. There was no awkwardness in her straightforward response. It might seem trivial, but it was quite rare for someone meeting Zoro and Toji for the first time. Toji had a large presence but seemed almost invisible, and Zoro, with his green hair and hard-to-ignore aura, often elicited various awkward reactions from people seeing them for the first time. Megumi cautiously asked, Can I, play? With Tsumiki? Sure. But don't run on the stairs. With permission from Zoro and Toji, Megumi's face lit up. Tsumiki, looking excited, firmly held Megumi's hand. Then, shall we go over there? Let's go on the slide. Tsumiki bounded away, and Megumi was swept along in her enthusiasm. 
Soon, with laughter, the two kids began to dash all over the playground. They took turns sliding down the slide and then ran around the playground perimeter, heeding Zoro's advice not to run on the stairs at all. Good kids, Zoro thought to himself. Toji watched Megumi with a pleased expression. Like father, like child. Already making friends with girls. Zoro made a disgusted sound. They're too young for that kind of talk. Besides, they can just be friends. Between boys and girls? What does gender have to do with anything? You don't have friends, do you? I had one. Zoro remained consistently vulnerable to such remarks, reminding him of Kuina, who would habitually say that. Even after becoming the strongest swordsman, those words never faded from his memory. Click. He touched the hilt of his sword, wondering if Kuina might have been reborn in this world too. Probably not, but the thought occasionally crossed his mind. Noticing Zoro's somber, distant expression, Toji quickly changed the subject. If you ever want to get married, bring them over. I won't object. Toji. I'm five. Zoro looked at him as if he had lost his mind, and Toji chuckled. Indeed, this expression was much better than the previous one. What are you drawing? Tsumiki. Megumi, holding a brown crayon, spoke cheerfully. Toji closely observed something on the sketchbook mixed with apricot and brown colors that Megumi had drawn. Looking closely, it seems like that girl's face might be what face. It was just an apricot circle with brown mixed in haphazardly. It was impossible to tell where the eyes were or where the hair was supposed to be. For the past two months, Megumi had played with Tsumiki every single day without fail. If the weather was nice, they played outside, if it was too hot or rainy, they came to Toji's house to play. They often played just the two of them, but there were times when Zoro or Toji joined in. They ate together, played until they were both exhausted, and sometimes fell asleep side by side. Although Tsumiki was older than Megumi, the difference was just a year, making them close companions. As this lifestyle continued, Zoro and Toji grew somewhat accustomed to Tsumiki's presence. Not as warmly as Megumi treats her, though. Hence, there was a slight distance between Zoro and Toji, and Tsumiki. Neither Toji nor Zoro paid it much mind. When is Tsumiki coming? She can come if her mom allows it. She probably will. Toji's lips twisted. Initially, her mother had come to the playground to pick up Tsumiki. She asked Toji if her child had played well with his kids, and if they had eaten anything together, making Toji think she was interested in her child. Did you feed her eggplant rice bowl? She said she doesn't like eggplant. Oh, is that so? There were odd things even then. The mother didn't seem to know what Tsumiki liked or disliked about food. After asking a few times, realizing Toji had a decent income and that Megumi and Tsumiki were taken care of together, Tsumiki's mother seemed to wait for the right moment to detach her interest from Tsumiki, as if she had been looking for a chance to pass her off. Toji was baffled by her attitude, which seemed like she was just waiting for the right timing. But it's not my place to criticize. Had it not been for Zoro taking him away, Toji would have continued to live in neglect as well. From this side, it wasn't a bad situation at all. Megumi really liked Tsumiki, and Tsumiki was very kind to Megumi. For Toji, the cost of one more child's food or toys was trivial. Even though he had a lot of extra money disappear because he didn't spend the cash he received from assassination jobs on gambling, but just kept it piled up inside his weapon storage spirit. Still, it wasn't like he couldn't afford to feed and take care of one more child. Tap tap, tap. Toji's sensitive hearing caught the light and cheerful sound of footsteps. He felt a familiar small presence at the entrance and heard a knock. Please open the door. Tsumiki. Megumi sprang up and ran towards the door. I don't think I've ever greeted anyone like that. Feeling oddly uneasy, Toji approached the door. Megumi was hanging onto the doorknob, struggling. It won't open. It's too heavy for you to open. The metal door, equipped with several security devices, was too heavy for a child not even three years old to open. Toji detached Megumi and easily opened the door. There stood Tsumiki, always with her gentle face. Tsumiki. Megumi. Megumi bounced in place. Tsumiki quickly took off her shoes and entered the house. Did you sleep well? What shall we play today? Um draw pictures. Good. Let's draw pictures together. The chatter of the two young children wasn't bad at all. Megumi indeed liked Tsumiki. Click. After washing up and changing clothes in the bathroom, Zaro shook his slightly damp hair. Then, he noticed Tsumiki. Ah, you're here. Tsumiki. Hello. Yeah. Tsumiki. Megumi tugged at Tsumiki's sleeve. Zoro saw this and sternly corrected him. Megumi, you shouldn't pull on Tsumiki's clothes. It's okay. Really? Yes. These clothes are too small anyway. If you really dislike it or it's not okay, say so. Yes. Tsumiki sat down with Megumi in front of the sketchbook. What to draw? A dog? A deer? A frog? 
holding a crayon each, their heads huddled close together as they talked, resembling sparrows. Toji approached Zoro. Is it okay? What is? It seems like Megumi plays with Tsumiki more than with you. It doesn't matter. I don't mind. If Megumi and Tsumiki are happy, that's good enough. No matter how much Zoro and Toji try, playing at Megumi's level was impossible. Being tenderly caring was also hard due to their personalities. Tsumiki was able to fulfill that role. Whether it becomes a bond of affection between family or friends, a love between partners, or just a fleeting emotion, it's still unclear. Either way, it wouldn't be bad. The more people who love Megumi, the better. Seems like we're spoiling Megumi too much. I want to draw a dog on the floor. No Megumi. That's how absolute no's are handled. Despite seeming overly gentle, Tsumiki surprisingly had a firm side, which Zoro found likable. Tsumiki looked at Toji, as if remembering something, and stood up. Sir, I have something for you. Tsumiki pulled something crumpled from her pocket and handed it over. Toji unfolded it to find a 10,000 yen bill. It was a lot of money for a 4-year-old to be carrying around. Toji flicked the 10,000 yen bill and asked, Where did you get this? From the uncle at our house. The uncle at our house, so probably not her biological father, but likely a stepfather or a man living with her mother. Why? He said not to stay home when there are guests, even at night? Yes. When I said I was going out, he told me to give this to the adult there so, it's for accommodation? Utterly disgraceful. Toji was about to refuse, but stopped when he noticed Sumiki subtly looking around, as if thinking she'd be driven out if he didn't accept. After stuffing the money into his pocket, Sumiki's face brightened. I'll be here for a few days. Um, tomorrow, tomorrow. Ah, the day after tomorrow. Until the day after tomorrow. Then, I need to buy a lot of food. Toji thought. Since they were running low on food at home and had one more mouth to feed, it seemed like a trip to the store was in order. Toji glanced at Sumiki. Is there anything you want to eat? Tomatoes. Got it. The department store was relatively quiet in the early afternoon on a weekday. Not that it was completely empty of people. And where there were people, there were always those things. Snap. Zaro flicked his fingers, wrapped in hockey. A fly-like curse that had been buzzing around him turned to dust and disappeared. Is it because it's a weekday? There were unusually few curses today. During their shopping trip, they had only encountered two of these fly-like curses. Technically, Zaro didn't need to bother with such minor curses, but he didn't like the idea of them getting too close to Megumi and Sumiki. Moreover, why does it feel so unsettling? There seemed to be no threat when he scanned the area with observation hockey. For a department store, it was unusually clean of curse energy. So why did it feel so odd? Feeling like someone was watching, Zoro quickly turned his head. Buzzing. There were about 10 of those fly-like curses buzzing around. Just flies, huh? Zoro exhaled in disdain and flicked his fingers again. Snap. Several flies were hit by the impact, fell, and turned directly into dust. Megumi, who had been watching Zoro closely, also tried to flick his fingers towards the flies. Of course, the flick of a two-year-old boy's fingers, wrapped in neither hockey nor cursed energy, did no harm to the flies, which easily dodged Megumi's attempt. Peek. That's not how you do it, Megumi. This is how you do it. Zaro deliberately wrapped his bare hand slowly with hockey and demonstrated slowly in the air, showing him how. Boom. The flies burst into pieces without Zoro's fingers even touching them. Megumi opened his mouth in awe. What are you two doing? Tsumiki, holding a black puppy plushie, came over and asked. Zaro naturally replied. There was something there. I caught it. Did Megumi catch it with you? No. I was teaching him how to catch them. Tsumiki cautiously looked at the space where the flies had been. Trying to find something in the air, the ceiling, and the floor, Tsumiki murmured with a downcast look. I wish I could do that kind of thing with Megumi too. Seeing Tsumiki's face darken, Zaro nonchalantly said. You can do it too. If you learn. Tsumiki's eyes sparkled as she lifted her head. Really how? Please teach me. Later. Okay. Toji approached, carrying several paper bags filled with various items in both hands. We've bought everything we need on this floor. Now we just need to buy clothes for Zoro. Toji had been buying clothes for Zoro almost every time they went shopping recently. The reason was simple. They didn't fit. Zoro was growing rapidly day by day, so clothes quickly became too small. Moreover, with his high level of activity and sweating, his clothes easily became worn out. The children's clothing store is on the third floor. We're on the seventh, right? Let's go down. Zaro frowned without saying a word. Why? I have a bad feeling. If asked why, he didn't exactly have an answer. But something felt off, and that feeling was getting stronger. Toji also had been sensing something subtle since earlier, so he understood Zoro's point. Then let's go home early. Thought tease. Whisk. 
Before they could finish their sentence, Zaro and Toji's bodies instantly turned around. Sumiki, not knowing the situation, blinked, and Megumi trembled with unease. It was an unmistakably blatant presence of a cursed spirit. Not special class, but maybe first class? Toji prepared to summon his weapon cursed spirit, while using his observation hockey to gauge the cursed spirit's class. Still, the question remained. Until just now, there was no sign of it. A cursed spirit appearing suddenly like this? In October, not even during the summer when cursed spirit are more prevalent, and a first class cursed spirit at that? Zoro positioned himself protectively in front of Megumi and Sumiki, gripping the handle of his sword Weido Ijimanji firmly. He then glanced at Toji. What should we do, dad? Toji was conflicted. For non-sorcerers, it was very fortunate that the cursed spirit was near an emergency exit where there were hardly any people. However, it was quickly moving towards them, seeking out people. It wasn't just any cursed spirit but a first-class one, too dangerous to ignore. Zaro could probably handle a first-class cursed spirit to some extent, but Megumi and Sumiki were a different story. It was impractical for Toji to take them all with him. It might be better to leave the kids here for their safety. Toji made a decision, put down the paper bag full of items on the floor, and spat out his arsenal spirit, Yuak. Megumi's eyes widened as he saw the arsenal spirit inflate in size suddenly. I'll handle this. You guys stay here. Come back quickly. All right. What's happening, mister? Got something to take care of. Wait here. After responding, Toji dashed towards the emergency exit with a speed that made him disappear from sight. Sumiki looked around in confusion at the sudden disappearance of Toji. Mr. Toji is, he'll be back soon. Although Zoro replied, he sharply scanned the surroundings. Something. Something is off. The whole situation. Considering it's a weekday, the absence of curses until now, the appearance of a group of 10 cursed spirit, the sudden emergence of a first class cursed spirit, and Toji just having left the scene. Is it all just a coincidence? No. This is a trap. Snap. Ah, we haven't paid for that yet. There's no time. Zaro ripped open the paper bag and found two new kitchen knives inside. He held one in his hand and secured the other along with his sword, Weido Ichimanji, to his belt. Normally, kitchen knives weren't meant for situations like this, but there was no choice. Whoosh. Power spread in all directions. Like ink spreading on white paper, the scenery around them changed in an instant. Zaro quickly pushed Sumiki and Megumi away. A giant pillar rose from where Tsumiki and Megumi had just been standing. All lights and sources of illumination disappeared, and pitch black darkness enveloped everything, climbing up the walls and ceiling. Soon, it was impossible to distinguish where the walls ended and the ceiling began, as everything was buried in perfect darkness. The space is closing off. Zaro. Eek. Stay there, both of you. When surveyed with observation hockey, Sumiki and Megumi were separated from Zaro and trapped in a different space, but they were safe for now. The hairs on Zaro's arms stood on end. It was unpleasant and suffocating. Something inside him was boiling over, making him feel like he couldn't endure without slashing something. It wasn't the fear or discomfort caused by the darkness. Something more fundamental was being touched, making him want to unleash something. Zaro looked up at the ceiling that seemed to bulge outwards, then dropped something massive to the floor as if spitting it out. It was a cursed spirit. The cursed spirit, which had been curled up, slowly unfolded and stood up on two legs. It looked more human-like than any other cursed spirit Zoro had sensed before. It had one head at the top, two arms and legs, and walked bipedally. And in the middle of its head, there was something embedded that concentrated power. This one is clearly more powerful than the one father chased earlier. Moreover, with the space divided, it was uncertain when Toji would return, or if he could return at all. This is bad. Realizing the situation, Zaro let out a groan. Bang. Toji opened the door to the emergency exit. Sensing the cursed spirit's presence moving quickly towards the lower floors, he immediately leaped through the space between the staircases. Skipping down several floors in an instant, Toji stood in front of the cursed spirit. It had a massive skull for a face, and its arms were sharp like a mantis's, resembling swords. The cursed spirit cackled at Toji. Such appearance you must be of the Zenin bloodline. Toji's expression twisted. It was unlikely for an ordinary cursed spirit to know about the Zenin. It must be a special cursed spirit that lived long enough to know about Zenin, or else. Were you originally a sorcerer turned cursed spirit? I, no, still, a sorcerer now. Shik. The mantis cursed spirit swung its sharp arms towards Toji. When a sorcerer dies from an attack infused with cursed energy or due to other causes, they can transform into a posthumous cursed spirit. That's why in families teeming with sorcerers like the Zenin, there are sorcerers assigned the role of killing those close to death with cursed energy, to prevent them from becoming cursed spirit themselves. Becoming the very thing they hunted all their lives would be the ultimate disgrace for a sorcerer. 
Just like this cursed spirit in front of him. I did not die. Became stronger. The cursed spirit swung its arms rapidly as if wielding a sword. Each swing sliced through the metal stairs as if they were butter. Boom. Toji dodged the slashes by moving his head. The wall of the emergency exit split in half following the cursed spirit's attack. No special techniques, just raw power and cursed energy. While it had the power of a grade 1 cursed spirit, if officially assessed by the Sorcerer's Association, it might be classified as grade 2, due to the lack of techniques. The association places a high value on the possession of techniques when grading cursed spirit. Then it's easy. Toji drew the split soul katana from the arsenal spirit's mouth. Any last words? Yao, we'll die. Sorry. But I know someone who's better with a sword than you. Swoosh. Toji cleanly sliced a cursed spirit's neck with the split soul katana. He casually wiped the splattered red fluid from his face onto his black t-shirt. It was time to go back. Just as Toji was about to store the split soul katana back into the arsenal spirit. Sensing the overwhelming cursed energy emanating from the direction where Zoro was, Toji froze for a fraction of a second, before immediately rushing to open the emergency exit door on the floor where Zoro was. Or, he tried to. Bang. Faced with a strong resistance from the door, Toji contorted his face in frustration. This is, so to say a barrier no, different. A domain. If it were the essence of sorcery known as domain expansion, Toji's face drained of color in an instant. Toji pulled out an inverted spear of heaven from the arsenal spirit with his other hand. He wrapped it in imbued black rope and thrust it into the door forming the domain. When the function of the inverted spear of heaven, which is supposed to deactivate any active techniques, didn't activate, Toji's eyes widened. There's no imposed technique? For the moment, that was a relief. If the domain was simply overlaying a natural born domain over the space without any imposed techniques, then at least it wouldn't have guaranteed hit or killing blow effects. It would just be isolating an entire floor as its domain. Or at least, he had to believe that was the case. Otherwise, he might just lose his mind right here and now. What do you, a monkey, know about domains to be so sure? What else could there be that you're assuming? Toji pushed aside the sneering whispers in one corner of his mind. Now was not the time to wallow in self-loathing. Even if there are no techniques or guaranteed hits, kills, I can't be at ease. Even if just manifesting a natural born domain was its limit, no cursed spirit below grade 1 could do even that. Meaning, the cursed spirit present here was special grade. Swish 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 swish. Toji rapidly swung the split soul katana. The door shattered into pieces, and a gap appeared in the domain. Domains fundamentally focus on confinement. They are weak to external shocks. The side of the department store distorted into pitch black darkness due to the domain entered Toji's vision. He quickly jumped into the gap into the domain. This damn it. Entering the domain, Toji cursed as he surveyed his surroundings with his heavenly sight. Even with his extraordinary vision, nothing was visible in this darkness. Moreover, the already vast department store had its space distorted by the natural born domain, making it absurdly large. As a result, the range of his heavenly sight didn't reach the end of the domain, making it difficult to pinpoint the exact location of the children. Under these circumstances, he had no choice but to run and find them. He focused as much as he could on their sensor sounds, though even that was faintly obscured by the natural born domain. He had to find them somehow. Toji gritted his teeth. He carried the life signal cards of Zoro and Megumi in his pocket, but he couldn't bring himself to check them. Just hang on a little longer. Toji ran through the domain at full speed, desperately hoping he wasn't too late. Preliminary report on the cursed spirit incident at Tokyo Iumlaut Iumlaut Department Store Date of Report. October 8, 2005 Author. Hanoka Sato, Assistant Supervisor Affiliated with Tokyo Jujutsu High. At approximately 1.25 p.m. on October 6, 2005, an unregistered special grade cursed spirit appeared on the seventh floor of the Iumlaut Iumlaut Department Store, located in Bunkyo Ward, Tokyo. The initial discovery was made by a department store employee, who, for unknown reasons, found it impossible to enter the seventh floor, and immediately reported to the police. The responding officers, unable to access the scene themselves, suspected the involvement of sorcery, and contacted the general headquarters. The general headquarters deemed the incident the work of a special grade cursed spirit, and dispatched Mei Mei, a first-class sorcerer and a senior student at our school, along with assistant supervisor Hanoka Sato to the scene. The cause of the cursed spirit's emergence remains unknown. Due to the incident, the entire seventh floor of the Iumlaut Iumlaut department store transformed and distorted into the cursed spirit's innate domain. Survivors testified that within this innate domain, neither precise hits nor lethal blows were effective. Although no spells were assigned to the domain, it had the effect of separating spaces according to existing structures and trapping individuals within the domain. 
As a result, 16 non-sorcerers including employees and customers, along with one sorcerer, were trapped inside the cursed spirit's innate domain. Among them, a non-sorcerer, a five-year-old boy named Zenin Zoro, confronted the special grade cursed spirit. Zoro glared at the cursed spirit before him. His fighting spirit, every sense in his body, even his sword, everything about Zoro was concentrated on his opponent. He could feel the cursed spirit's five eyes rolling towards him. That thing is focusing on me. It was a relief for Zoro, knowing that Tsumiki and Megumi were nearby. If the cursed spirit had targeted them first, things would have become much more complicated. Swish. Zoro drew his sword in a Waito Ichimanji stance. The dark blade of his sword pointed directly at the cursed spirit. Holding a kitchen knife in one hand and his sword in the Waito Ichimanji stance in the other, Zoro glared at the cursed spirit through the darkness. I can't see its eyes at all. That wasn't much of a problem for him. Zoro possessed observation hockey, and in his previous life, he had lived with one eye blind. He even trained his hockey with his eyes closed on purpose. The problem is what that thing does in this darkness. Boom. Before he could finish his thought, a massive pillar seemed to shoot up from the ground, aiming to crush Zoro's jaw. Zoro jerked his head back to dodge. The pillar continued to rise, striking the ceiling with a loud bang. 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 Zoro swung his armament heart and black blade at the four successive pillars that sprang from the floor. Swoosh. 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 After cutting through three pillars and dodging one, Zoro recalled an explanation once given by Toji. Both cursed spirits and sorcerers possess unique abilities and spells that they use as their primary force. Pillars no, are these supposed to be thorns? It seemed that the creature's spell involved creating thorns. It was questionable whether something larger and thicker than an average building's pillar could be called a thorn. In any case, this spell suited the damn darkness well. Without observation hockey, I would have been skewered by those massive thorns by now or crushed beneath thorns as thick as pillars. With a rapid series of pops, the giant pillar-like thorns vanished, and smaller thorns began to cover the floor. Zaro dodged the sprouting thorns on the floor, running swiftly. These thorns, about one meter in size, were much smaller than the previous pillar-like ones, but there were dozens more of them, and they appeared much faster than the giant thorns before. Sheik. Arg. It was too late. Unable to dodge in time or code his body in armament hockey, a thorn pierced Zoro's left foot deeply. Quickly pulling his foot free from the thorn and dodging another aiming for his torso, Zoro leaped high. Whining about pain was a surefire way to die in a life or death battle. Pit. As a medium-sized thorn struck, a toothpick-sized smaller thorn whizzed by at incredible speed, grazing Zoro's left cheek. A burning pain spread where the thorn grazed him. The blood flowing from his face felt as hot as boiling water. Poison. It was just a graze, not a deep wound, but the pain was as severe as if his cheek had been scorched by fire. Though the veins on his left face bulged and turned scarlet, Zaro, accustomed to pain, ignored the discomfort and, swords in hand, charged at the cursed spirit. Two sword style, this time, Notoryu. Zaro slashed upwards at the cursed spirit with both swords. However, only a swishing sound was heard, and his blades caught nothing. Sensing movement behind him, Zaro turned around. Santoryu. His downward slash was easily dodged by the cursed spirit. So fast. Kuku Kuku. Laughter seemed to emanate from the darkness, as if the cursed spirit was mocking him. Creak. Once again, pillar-sized thorns surged from the walls and ceiling, aiming to pierce Zoro's body. Leaping high into the air, Zoro saw the floor was densely covered with medium-sized thorns. Are they trying to prevent me from landing? Crack. Zoro split a pillar-sized thorn in half, only for another giant pillar-like thorn to rush towards him. Flash. Fwit, boom. Zaro sliced through the thick, descending thorns horizontally and darted through them. But soon, countless medium-sized thorns began to sprout from the ground, prompting Zoro to grit his teeth. This is never ending. He needed to find a way out. Otherwise FSSHT. The smallest poison lot and thorn flew towards Zoro. Quickly, he swung his Waito Ichimanji, breaking the poison thorn. The cursed spirit, unfazed, laughed again from within the darkness. Quagagagang. Amidst the insurmountable pillars, medium-sized thorns densely filled the space, targeting Zoro. Between them, the smallest poison thorns flew. All three types at once. Two sword style, Cyclone. Coating his entire body with armament hockey, Zoro used his sword wind to knock down the poison thorns and block the biggest thorns with his sword. Kong. Zoro's arms bulged with veins under the immense force pressing against him. In that moment, the special grade cursed spirit approached from behind Zoro. Ah, no. Crunch. The cursed spirit's thorny foot struck Zoro in the abdomen as he turned, sending him flying into the wall. Bang. There was the scent of flowers. Awakened by the sweet smell brushing against his nose, Zoro suddenly looked up. 
The darkness and the cursed spirit were gone, and he found himself standing in the middle of a garden, brimming with wisteria. Beneath his feet, red thistles grew thick and strong, covering the earth. The ground, barely visible beneath the tough thistles, was dark red and sticky, as if soaked with blood. The wisteria was so dense that not even sunlight could penetrate, leaving the sky obscured. Clusters of bell-shaped lavender flowers bloomed profusely, hanging heavily. Was this where the sweet fragrance came from? Zoro reached out and touched a wisteria flower. Then he realized. This body was not that of a child anymore. He was much taller, and his left eye wouldn't open. It was clearly the body he had before he died. He turned his head suddenly. In the distance, a plane mixed with cosmos and sunflowers could be seen. Unlike where Zoro stood, that place was bathed in warm sunlight, and the ground was white. There was someone unmistakable there. Even without his characteristic wide smile, the expressionless face couldn't mask the identity of the boy wearing the trademark straw hat with black hair. No matter his appearance, he could not be anyone but the boy. The person Zoro had followed with all his heart, for the first and last time. He slowly began to walk. The boy also walked towards Zoro. They stopped abruptly at the boundary of their realms. Under the blooming purple wisteria and entangled red thistles on one side, and the cosmos and sunflower field on the white soil on the other. After a moment of observing the boy's face, Zoro cracked a smile. I thought I'd see hell, but I never expected to see you. Luffy. Zoro called out the boy's name. Zoro. In an uncharacteristically emotionless voice, Luffy called out Zoro's name. Zoro sighed, knowing well why Luffy was acting this way, without needing it to be said. Zoro had died once, and even now, he was close to death. This was the exact opposite of what Luffy had hoped for Zoro. Live as you wish. In the end, what Luffy wanted for Zoro was life. Zoro looked at Luffy's unusually determined face, and then scratched his head. It couldn't be helped. He never wished for death, nor did he intend it. But death always followed Zoro. After all, he was a swordsman. There were numerous instances where he barely survived the brink of life and death, whether it was his opponent dying or himself. Once, he actually did die. And in living, there were times when living as you wish and living itself were in conflict. In the world of his previous life, and even in this current world, it was natural for Zoro to risk his life to achieve what he wanted. There are ambitions to pursue. There are people to protect. There are dreams to continue. There is an era to advance to. Knowing full well that defending these things would certainly lead to death. Those who ventured into the sea all had one or two of these things. Of course, Zoro did too. Above all, Luffy had no right to reproach Zoro for this. Because you did the same. Luffy said nothing to Zoro's words. Then, he opened his mouth to ask. Did you want to protect it? Of course. It was the end of your dream. I remember Luffy's face, the brightest smile I've seen, on the day when all adventures came to an end. There were great drinks, lively songs and dances, and many people we had met along the way, but the smile on Luffy's face was what struck Zoro's soul eye the most. The look of Luffy showing the end of his dream. Zoro, look. This is the end of my dream. Cool, isn't it? Yeah. It was ridiculous laughably hilarious, and dazzlingly bright truly, a magnificent end. The moment Luffy's dream ended, the world also changed. It had to change. The old rotten world did not have the strength to bear its end. The era of great piracy, which had overripened to the point of bursting, came to an end, and a new era began. It was a ridiculous, bright, and laughable era. Just like the dream that Luffy had opened the curtain to. So, I protected it. With. Everything I had. Did you protect it because it was the era I opened? Zoro looked at Luffy with a gaze as if looking at the greatest fool, then sighed. Idiot. Zoro said to Luffy in a haughty tone. I don't do things I hate. Even if it was the era Luffy had ushered in, if he had hated that era, he would have let it fall apart. Luffy hadn't ordered Zoro to protect that era of the world. Not turning a blind eye and standing up to protect was all Zoro's choice. It was a splendid era, an improved world. He liked it. So, he protected it. It was the same when he stood up to cursed spirit for Tsumiki and Megumi. It was all decided and acted upon by Zoro. He was not swept away by the situation, nor did he take it on reluctantly. He has no regrets. Not then, not now. And certainly not in the future. So, I must go. He couldn't die hesitating in a place like this. He couldn't leave his father with the pain of thinking that if he had been there, if he had been stronger, he could have protected him. That was the least Zoro could do as a son for his father. Luffy's expressionless face broke into a smile, a smile that Zoro knew too well, one that resembled the sun. Then, go. At those cheerful yet firm words, Zoro couldn't help but smile. Right. He must go. Now was not the time for them to meet. It was nice, Luffy. Me too. Zoro, looking at the bright smile, forcibly turned away his gaze that didn't want to part. It's a farewell. 
Just like before. He drew his sword and swung it. A tremendous sword wind caused the wisteria petals to fall like a snowstorm. Luffy's figure, too, was obscured by the rain of purple petals. Live as you wish. Shackles, past, good and evil, era, world. Don't care about any of it. Zaro nodded to Luffy's voice lingering like an echo. Ah. Indeed. After all, it's a waste to be caught up only in the past. Click clack. Zaro got up from the wall he had crashed into. It seemed like hardly any time had passed. Maybe two seconds, three seconds. He touched the area that had been grazed by the poison thorn earlier. This poison, did it also have hallucinogenic effects? He wasn't sure if what he had just seen was a result of the sudden shock or a hallucination created by the poison. Perhaps, at the crossroads of life and death, the fingertips of the living and the dead briefly touched. Well, either way is fine. Thanks to that, I've come to my senses. GRRR? For the first time, the cursed spirit seemed to let out a sound of confusion at the sight of Zoro standing up. Zoro laughed, even as blood streamed down his forehead. You, you won't be able to use your curse techniques for a while, right? According to Toji, using power forcefully without a corresponding penalty always comes with a cost and curse techniques. Just now, that guy used three types of thorns at the same time to push Zoro. Originally, he would use only one type at a time, in the order of the largest thorn, the medium-sized mass of thorns, and then the smallest poison thorn. And then, immediately afterward, making thorns sprout from his body to attack Zoro was an extra. If using all of that at once resulted in a cooldown period for using curse techniques, then it all makes sense. There are no longer any annoying obstacles to cutting that guy down. Of course, Zoro still needs to muster the strength to do it. A young body is weak. Just losing this much blood made his head dizzy. I can't rag this out. Zoro looked at the kitchen knife still sheathed at his waist. Should he draw it? No, not necessary. It's not because the situation isn't life-threatening. One blade is enough to cut him down. One strike. And everything with a single strike. Feeling a strange power enveloping his body at the thought, Zoro flinched. He didn't know what it was, but it wasn't the time to worry about that. Zoro kept the kitchen knife sheathed at his waist. Now, the only sword in Zoro's hand was the Wado Ichimanji. Clang. Zoro slowly turned the sword in a full circle, holding the handle of the Wado Ichimanji, even as he sheathed it. One sword style, draw. The Lion's Song. Swoosh. A jet black armament hockey rippled over his entire body. Like water about to overflow, it surged without spilling out. Cursed spirit wriggled its arm and then charged towards Zoro. Zoro stood still with his sword, feeling the presence of an arm stretching out to crush his neck. And then, finally. Click. The sword was drawn. A moment of silence passed. The cursed spirit fumbled over its body, then, thinking it hadn't been cut, turned around cheerfully. Of course, it was a mistake. Swoosh. Zoro slowly sheathed the sword that was halfway drawn. Clang. Kuik. As the sword was fully sheathed, Cursed Spirit's body split in half. It collapsed, screaming and spurting black blood, and then crumbled into a handful of dust. A single withered finger remained there. Whoosh. The darkness receded, and the original appearance of the department store was revealed. The domain was broken. The people trapped in the darkness buzzed with whispers as the appearance of the department store came back into view. What's going on? Was there a power outage? Everyone, please follow my instructions and evacuate calmly. Tsumiki, who had been sitting with Megumi in her arms, ran towards Zoro. Zoro. Don't look. It's not a sight for kids. Feeling as if all the strength was draining from his body, Zoro slumped down on the spot in exhaustion. Feeling something under him as he sat, Zoro picked it up. This was, well a finger? It was red, withered, and the nails were black and pointed, but it was definitely a finger. He didn't know why the finger was here. Feeling like he should keep it, even though he wasn't sure what it was, Zoro casually tucked it inside his belt. Sumiki, with tears welling up in her eyes, couldn't bring herself to touch Zoro's bloodied body. Zoro let out a small laugh. I told you not to look. I'm fine. How can you say you're fine? Her voice was loud. It was a relief to see she still had energy. Amidst it all, it was brotherly of Megumi to tightly hug her, preventing her from seeing Zoro. Zoro blinked his eyes. He still needed to stay conscious. He wasn't sure if Megumi and Sumiki were safe or not. His whole body hurt. Zaro forced his eyelids, which kept trying to close, open. Something quickly approaching caught in Zoro's observation hockey. Just as Zoro was struggling to get up, thinking it might be an enemy. Zaro. Ah, it's Toji. With that thought as his last, Zaro lost consciousness. Just before grade 1 sorcerer Mei Mei entered the scene, the innate domain was released. It was confirmed that the curse had been exercised. 14 non-sorcerers who did not directly encounter the curse, suffered no significant injuries, and were sent home after a simple investigation. 
Non-sorcerer child Zenon Zoro, 5 years old, male, sustained injuries that were life-threatening. His father, Zenon Toji, present at the scene, immediately transported Zenon Zoro to the main school, where reverse curse technician Ieri Shoko administered treatment. However, due to the severity of his injuries, Zenon Zoro has not regained consciousness even two days after the incident. No remnants were found at the scene, but traces believed to have come from the sword Zenin Zoro, had were discovered in various places. Based on this, Mei Mei, who investigated the scene, claimed that Zenin Zoro alone exercised a special grade curse. However, considering that Zenin Zoro is a five-year-old non-sorcerer, and the presence of his father, Zenin Toji, a thousand demon queller, and sorcerer Zenin Megumi at the scene, it is unclear who actually exercised the special grade curse. Given the circumstances, the main school plans to interrogate Zenin Zoro for an accurate understanding of the situation, as soon as he recovers. If Zenin Zoro directly exercised the special grade curse or helped in exercising the special grade curse a decision will be made regarding his admission to the Tokyo Metropolitan Curse Technical College. Toji ran like lightning and caught Zoro as he collapsed in his arms. Holding the body soaked in blood and poison, Toji's heart sank with a thud. It felt as if the blood running through his body turned into ice water, chilling him to the core instantly. The last image of Jie, covered in blood, overlapped with the current state of Zoro, causing Toji's entire body to shiver. No. It can't be. You have to open your eyes, Zoro. Please take care of Zoro and Megumi. I, as a father, don't have the strength to endure this a second time. Uncle Tsumiki's scream brought Toji back to his senses slightly. Tsumiki grabbed Toji's face with both hands and, with tears streaming down her face, shouted as loudly as she had ever since meeting Toji. We need to go to the hospital now, those words brought some sense back to Toji. Zoro was a mess of wounds, had lost a lot of blood, and was invaded by the curse's poison, but. He was still breathing, and his heart was still beating. He was still alive. Toji untied Zoro's belt and tied it tightly around the biggest wound on his stomach to stop the bleeding. Thud. During the process, a finger that had been inside Zoro's belt fell out. Seeing it, Toji's eyes widened before turning cold as the north wind in midwinter. Toji carelessly stuffed the finger into his pants pocket and touched Zoro's cheek. The red poison of the curse spreading through his veins was visible even from the outside. A simple wound might have been one thing, but the curse's poison was beyond the help of non-sorcerer medicine. Both magical and medical treatments were necessary. He took out his cell phone from his pocket. Toji dialed the number as fast as he could, trying not to break the keypad with his strength. He called Goho Satoru's number, which he had saved never believing he would actually need to use it. Fortunately, Goho answered after two rings. As soon as he did, Toji blurted out. Do you know a reverse curse technician? Toji? Hey, why are you calling all of a sudden, no one or not? Just get to the point Goho immediately responded to Toji's desperate demand. My classmate is a reverse curse technician. She's currently in Tokyo. Tokyo? What else, Kyoto? He had to go there. Toji, with one arm holding Zoro and the other arm squeezing Tsumiki and Megumi to his side, secured the cell phone on his shoulder. The realization that Zoro had not wanted to go to the sorcerer's school came belatedly to mind, but Toji was unyielding. Later. He could accept any backlash from Zoro later. After Zoro was energetic enough to get really angry and healthy enough to swing his sword. He would gladly accept resentment, reprimand, disappointment, hatred, whatever it might be. But now, they had to go. To Tokyo. Give me the location. You're coming? You said before you wouldn't just the location. Goho quickly recited the address, prompted by Toji's barking voice. Toji's mind immediately pinpointed the location on the mental map of Tokyo he had memorized. It was in a rare mountainous area within Tokyo. Going by vehicle would be too slow. Toji disappeared from the spot before the sound of his step could even settle. Hmm, I didn't expect it to fail. Or, was it a success? Alive or dead? A woman with short hair and a scar stitched across her forehead tilted her head and thought. If I had confirmed him being loaded into the ambulance, I would have known for sure. Even if he was alive, if he was transported to a non-sorcerer hospital, it would be easy to intervene. She stood on the rooftop of a building opposite the department store, twirling a strand of her hair as she looked down at the department store surrounded by police and ambulances. Zenin Zoro. The woman murmured the name of the child she was looking for. However, no matter how much she enhanced her vision with her powers, she couldn't find the green-haired boy among the people. Either he died without leaving a body, or Zenin Toji took him somewhere out of sight for treatment. The former would be preferable, but unfortunately, the latter seemed more likely. If it's the latter, he must have gone to the Tokyo Metropolitan Curse Technical College. With Tenjin's barrier and Goho Satoru there, along with a very rare reverse curse technician among the sorcerers. Upon reaching that conclusion, she neatly gave up on tracking them down. It wasn't the time to intervene there. 
Not yet. His lifeline is strong. The woman stated plainly. It was purely by chance that she learned about Zen and Zoro, while keeping an eye on Goho Satoru's movements. Initially, she was curious about what aspect drew Goho Satoru's interest, and after some investigation, she intended to eliminate him. A non-sorcerer, not even a mighty curse user, attracting Goho Satoru's interest because of his strength. Despite some interest, such a thing was unnecessary for her plans. It would only be a hindrance. Still, that was quite impressive earlier. She was honestly a bit surprised when Zoro looked directly at her location earlier. I intentionally maintained the body of Itadori Kaori, close to a non-sorcerer, and stayed far away, thinking he wouldn't notice if it was a strong body. Yet he noticed. It was indeed a remarkable talent. She had spread sage powder in advance to conceal her presence, but judging the risk too high to approach any closer, she immediately moved to this place, the rooftop of the building next to the department store. Therefore, she didn't see how Zoro fought with the curse. She only knew that a special grade curse had been exercised. Whether Zoro did it alone or with the help of other sorcerers or Zen and Toji was unclear. I lured a grade 1 curse user with Sukuna's fingers secretly smuggled in to create a special grade curse, aiming for a definitive kill. The outcome was disappointing. She had hoped to at least cripple him. Well still, understanding his strength isn't a total loss. To think that someone his age could already exercise a special grade curse was beyond imagination. In another 10 years, he might become a formidable force comparable to the future Goho Satoru. So, it trots, but it's still Zenin. Born to a non-sorcerer, a thousand demon queller with no cursed energy or techniques, yet capable of confronting a special grade curse. Indeed, it was peculiar. She didn't understand why everyone born into the Zenin family, the most technique-obsessed among the Goho clan, turned out like that. Or, is it because he's a Zenin that something like that was born? She hadn't paid much attention, thinking the clan was on its decline, but now she thought she should plant someone there. She became interested in the genetic traits of the Zenin family. With a change of body, should I marry into the Zenin family? Would another like him be born? Musing over a thought that would horrify others so casually, she refreshed her mind. Well, the talk of Zenin Zoro becoming as strong as Goho Satoru is a story for when he's grown up another 10 years. There are plenty of ways to trample an unfinished sprout. If it can't be trampled, waiting another 100 years is also fine. Of course, since this waiting isn't just for a year or two, her wish was to see the end within 20 years. It was somewhat unsettling for her when obstacles appeared just as she felt she was about to achieve her goal. If Zen and Zoro is alive, Zen and Toji probably won't touch the growth vessel. She needed to think about how to involve Zen and Toji. As an entity outside the cause and effect of sorcery, he must be made to interfere with the growth vessel integration event happening next year. The woman stretched thoroughly and massaged various parts of her body. It's about time to dispose of Itadori Kaori. The vessel had grown quite a bit, and there wouldn't be any need to approach Zoro for a while. There was no reason to maintain this body any longer. Maybe I should lay low for a while. After all, releasing a special grade curse in the Tokyo department store was such an outrageous act that even the laziest higher-ups would make some effort to look for the perpetrator. The thousand demon queller's cursed energy must be quite stirred up by now. It was best to keep a low profile for a while. It was too risky to confront Zen and Toji in this body. It might not be a bad idea to leave the country for a few months. Not much longer now. She murmured softly. A thousand years. It's been a thousand years. She had been chasing her dream for a millennium. If she missed this opportunity, who knows when another like it would come around. Dring. She took out her cell phone, which was ringing loudly. The screen displayed the name Itadori Jin. His wife's lover must be worried about Itadori Kaori, who said she was going shopping and hadn't returned. The woman looked at the phone for a moment, then, with a disinterested expression, crushed it with a curse technique. Now that Itadori Kaori had outlived her usefulness, there was no reason to answer Itadori Jin's call. I don't know what mindset I was in when I ran. I don't know what mindset brought me to the school. The only thing keeping Toji's mind anchored were the heartbeats of the children in his arms. In front of the school's barrier, three figures appeared like black dots. Goho Satoru, a cursed sorcerer, and an unfamiliar female student sorcerer. Probably the reverse curse technician Goho Satoru had mentioned. Toji was in front of the reverse curse technician in the blink of an eye. The female student, who had been smoking, dropped her cigarette in surprise. Ah shit, you scared me. Zenin? When did you hey, gorilla? Toji ignored the reactions of the kids and laid down the bloodied Zoro. Megumi and Sumiki were also placed down. Ugh, ugh. Perhaps because they arrived too quickly, Sumiki covered her mouth with her hand and started to retch before running off to a corner. Toji felt sorry, but Zoro was more urgent. The kids hurt. We need a reverse curse technician. What in the world what happened to him? Why is he hurt? Goho Satoru looked at Zoro and started yelling in shock. 
He was attacked by a curse. Probably, a special grade. Special grad what happened? And the special grade curse? Killed it. Who shot it, all of you? Everyone fell silent at the grim words of Ieri Shoko. Shoko had been carefully examining Zoro even as the men spoke. A curse's poison had seeped into his left cheek, there were several holes in his body, and he had lost a lot of blood. Honestly, considering the boy's weight and the amount of blood he could hold, it was a miracle he didn't die from excessive blood loss on the way to the school. Shoko used a reverse curse technique on the wound on Zoro's stomach. The injury, which had been punctured and open, healed as if it had never been there. Despite this, Shoko bit her lip hard. This is the limit of what we can do here. The poison all the antidote equipment is inside the school's barrier. The situation was serious, but not so dire that nothing could be done. The medical equipment housed within the school could facilitate recovery, though it would take time. However, the problem was that people not registered with the school's barrier could not be brought in. Deciding who enters the school's barrier wasn't up to Shoko. It was the higher-ups, particularly Tenjin, who created the barrier. Brother. For the first time, Megumi reached out to the injured Zoro. The young Megumi, not fully understanding the situation, grabbed Zoro's fallen arm. As slick blood smeared his hand, he recoiled in shock from the cold wave of fear. Why is it red? Why isn't he moving? Why does it smell like metal? I'm scared. Why isn't he hugging me? When I'm scared, my brother always hugs me. Why? Why? His body trembled. Instinctual fear took over, rendering him tearless from head to toe. And Toji was no different in his fear. If we bring the equipment, there's not just sorcery equipment but also non-sorcerer stuff that operates on electricity. Do you think we have an extension cord long enough to reach from there to here? Then, what do we do? What is the plan? Should we take him to a hospital now? Will Zoro last until then? If the school's barrier were destroyed by natural disaster, then maybe Zoro could be brought inside. After that, grabbing the reverse curse technician by the neck and demanding they save Zoro could work. Although reverse curse technicians were rare, the combat strength she sensed from her was weak. Just handle Goho and the curse sorcerer, then we can deal with the rest of the school's forces. It was when Toji, almost crazed, was about to fetch the natural disaster from the armory curse. What's that? Goho Satoru grimaced. Looking back at the school entrances Tori, a traditional Japanese gate most commonly found at the entrance of or within a Shinto shrine, Goho slightly lowered his sunglasses and stared into the void. Though invisible to the eyes of a non-sorcerer, the barrier there was clearly visible to him. Is it changing? He could clearly see the barrier being overlaid with new layers of cursed energy. Shoko looked back at Goho and Jido with a troubled expression. Even if they were to send him to a non-sorcerer's hospital, they had to do everything possible beforehand. You all, head to the infirmary and gather all the devices you see, that's okay, Shoko. The three first years turned their heads. Yagamasa Michi emerged from inside the school's barrier. Jido, surprised, asked. Mr. Yaga? Why are you here? Yaga glanced at Jido, then sidelong at Toji. As a sorcerer with considerable experience, Yaga was aware of the existence known as a sorcerer killer. He had no idea that such an infamous killer in the underworld could be such a young man, and moreover, of the Zenin lineage. However, he hadn't come here to fight this man. Likewise, the other party hadn't come to fight either. Yaga looked down at Zoro, who was restlessly nestled in the arms of the sorcerer killer. On the surface, he seemed like a non-sorcerer child unlucky enough to be caught in a curse's attack if that were the case, Tenjin wouldn't have called me because of this child. Recalling the voice of Tenjin on the phone, a voice he had heard for the first time in his life, Yaga spoke. Master Tenjin has granted them permission to enter the school. Excuse me? It means they've modified the barrier to allow these people in. There's no reason to stay outside. Why? I don't know that, Suguru. Toji blinked. Before he could fully grasp what Yaga was saying, he stood up, holding Zoro, Megumi, and Tsumiki, who had noticed and approached, under his right arm. Where's the infirmary? That building? Following Ieri Shoko's direction, Toji immediately picked her up on his back hand, holding the three children tightly, dashed into the barrier. Ah, that crazy gorilla. Shoko. Goho and Jido also hurried in the direction Toji went. Along with a whooshing sound, the dust kicked up by their running spread out and hit Yaga's face. Left alone without even a chance to speak to his guest, Yaga Masamichi dusted off the sand from his face. With a heavy heart, Yaga headed to the infirmary. It seemed like the school was about to be turned upside down. Ieri Shoko entered the treatment room with Zoro, carrying a variety of medical equipment, talismans, and bottles of medicine whose purposes were unclear. She then sent Goho and Jido out of the building and slammed the door shut. Even Toji, Zoro's father, was firmly sent out of the treatment room on the grounds that his presence would be a hindrance. 
The decisiveness of her action left Toji with no room to argue, though unlike Goho and Jido, he wasn't expelled from the building, but waited outside the treatment room. Staggering slightly, Toji sat down on a chair placed in front of the infirmary, with Megumi and Sumiki tucked under his arms. It had been a long time since he felt dizzy. With trembling hands, Toji took out Zoro's Viver card, which he had been too afraid to check earlier. Zoro's Viver card had shrunk to about half its original size, as if singed by fire. However, it was gradually returning to its original size, indicating that Zoro's injuries were healing. Ha only then did Toji let out a sigh he had been holding back. Coming here was the right decision. Zoro was recovering. Megumi tugged at Toji's sleeve, shaking it. Earlier, when Shoko took Zoro away, Megumi had thrown a tantrum, crying not to take his brother, but now seemed somewhat calmed down by Tsumiki, though his eyes were still brimming with tears. Papa, brother? He's gone in to get treated. Treated? Yeah. He'll hurt less after. I don't like brother being hurt to Megumi's tearful voice, Toji murmured softly, me neither. I should have protected him. I didn't want him to be hurt. I didn't want him to be in a place he disliked. Being a father, yet unable to properly do anything for his child, always making things harder for him. Now, too, he just sat there, holding onto a piece of paper. Feeling powerless, and again, because of his powerlessness, Toji found it hard to bear himself. If only I could create barriers around our residents like those Zenin bastards. If only I had cursed energy, or even better, if I were just an ordinary non-sorcerer with no ties to this messed up world. None of this would have happened. Because I am your father. Because I am me Toji turned his head. At the end of the corridor, he saw the grim-faced male sorcerer he had seen earlier. What was his name? He couldn't quite remember. It wasn't strange. Toji wasn't good at remembering men's names. More accurately, he didn't bother to. I have no intention of fighting. Yaga Masamichi spoke calmly to Toji. Toji, ready to spring into action at any moment, tensely smiled. Then, get rid of those first. Pointing towards the corner of the ceiling, Toji indicated where Yaga had secretly hidden numerous combat-ready cursed corpses. Yaga, after pondering what to say, spoke honestly. Knowing who you are, a minimum level of defense was necessary. After all, I am a teacher here. But again, I had no intention of fighting. This guy knew Toji was a sorcerer killer. It meant he had considerable experience and knew well the state of the sorcery world. Ready to summon the armory curse at any moment, Toji remained taut as a drawn string. Tsumiki clutched Toji's collar tightly. Toji slightly shifted his position to completely shield Megumi and Tsumiki from Yaga's view. Although he didn't sense hostility from the other party, it seemed to make the children feel more secure. I don't plan to make the first move either. In the past, he would have eliminated anything that annoyed him, whether they were cursed corpses or humans, but now was not the time. Zoro was receiving treatment from a reverse curse technician affiliated with the school, and with Megumi and Sumiki behind him, there was nothing to gain from clashing with someone from the school. I will compensate. There's no need for that. This matter was directly requested by Master Tenjin to the school. Tenjin? Why, and how does that person know about Zoro? Catching on to Toji's confusion, Yaga shook his head. I don't know the details either. What Yaga had been told over the phone was to modify the barrier to allow the people waiting outside into the school, and to provide treatment, if there was anyone injured among the guests. And Master Tenjin has expressed a desire to meet your eldest son next summer. Next summer? Yes. Toji couldn't understand why Tenjin would want to see Zoro, especially specifying next summer. From his expression, it seemed Yaga didn't know the reason either. And Master Tenjin said that Zoro-kun could be protected at the Tokyo Metropolitan Curse Technical College. Toji's scar twitched at the corner of his mouth, prompting Yaga to quickly add, it's protection, not enrollment. Unlike other students, Zoro-kun won't be sent on missions. And if the family wishes, you may also come to the school. It's an offer, not coercion. That might be the case now. If they accept the school's protection now, Zaro would surely be enrolled in the school by the time he turns 15. He would live as a sorcerer rather than a non-sorcerer. At least he would be safe. Tenjin's barrier techniques are said to be the best in Japan, so a terrible incident like encountering a special grade curse while shopping at a department store wouldn't happen. The question is how Tenjin knows about Zoro, and whether Tenjin wants Zoro to become a sorcerer. Regardless of these questions, Toji had his answer ready. That's for him to decide. Who he meets and what he does in the future is entirely up to Zoro. It's not something Toji can promise on Zoro's behalf. The priority is the child's recovery. I understand that. But please consider it positively. I told you. It's not for me to decide. Sensing the rejection in his tone, Yaga took a step back. After all, Tenjin had only asked him to convey the message, not to enforce it if refused. There's one more thing I'd like to ask. 
The exorcism of the special grade curse at the Tokyo department store today, was it done by your son? Toji looked at Yaga with an expressionless face. Yaga felt a chill run through his body, intuitively understanding that it was best to keep as hidden as possible, the fact that Mei Mei had reported this to the Jujutsu High. If this man knew about Mei Mei, her safety couldn't be guaranteed. Yaga spoke cautiously, the incident has been reported to the headquarters. The assistant supervisor who went to the scene was associated with the Zenin family. Though it was Mei Mei who reported to the school, it was the assistant supervisor Sato Hanoka who reported to the headquarters. No one knew that Sato Hinoka was the illegitimate child of a sorcerer from the Zenin family. If they had known earlier, the Goho family wouldn't have remained silent since the Tokyo Metropolitan Curse Technical College is where Goho Satoru attends. They would have been furious, thinking the Zenin family had placed a spy on Satoru. I never thought they'd conduct an on-site investigation and send a preliminary report to the headquarters right away. Exorcism of the Special Grade Curse at the Tokyo Department Store. Exercised by Zenin Zoro. Male. 5 years old. Though just a few words long, it was enough to cause an uproar at the Jujutsu headquarters. A mere five-year-old exercised a special grade curse? And a Zenin at that? Such immense talent, whose child is he, is he from the main or branch family of Zenin, how can a five-year-old kill a special grade, was some trick used, is he not human but a curse? Yaga felt as if he could already hear what they would say. Being under the Zenin name might keep them from crossing certain lines, given the family's influence. By now, the Zenin family must be thoroughly searching for male children bearing the Zenin surname. If he's from the main family, the clan would already know, so they're likely searching the branch families. Yaga didn't know why Toji bore the Zenin surname, why he left Zenin to work as a sorcerer killer, or whether he was from the main or branch family. He simply assumed that since Zoro was a Zenin, his father Toji must be one as well. The father and son don't look much alike for a father-son relationship. At that point, Yaga stopped his train of thought. It was best not to delve deeper. Sorcerer's family affairs were often complicated and touchy. Mistakenly provoking someone could lead to a bad end, especially with the three great families. And that concludes this episode. If you enjoyed it, I'd seriously love it if you guys could leave a like on the video as it genuinely helps out so much, and it keeps me going, plus it takes only one second. That said, have a wonderful day. See you in the next one.